So uh, we are going to talk this morning first about flame instabilities, and then uh, um, the last lecture will be on uh, the turbulent flame speed. Um, so some comments about uh, stability theory in general of uh, fluid flow. I mean, you recognize that combustion of, of gaseous mixture, it's a fluid flow. So, so that's why I keep emphasizing fluid mechanics. Um, so uh, there are many equilibrium states that can be drastically changed by perturbations, and perturbations are inevitable uh, in, 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 uh, in every uh, situation, uh, including every experiment. So if those small perturbations uh, cause the solution to change drastically, so what we say is that the basic state or the equilibrium state is unstable, and the solution develop into something else over time. And uh, so these instability are sometimes desirable because they can enhance mix mixing, for example, but they are sometimes undesirable because they can cause large fluctuation and uh, damage, uh, say, the combustor or what have you. Uh, the aim of stability theory is uh, uh, two, to, first of all, to provide a decision-making uh, which uh, equilibrium is stable or not. And the second thing is, and this is usually done by linear theory, in other words, you introduce, as we shall see, a small perturbation to the equilibrium state, and you ask whether that small perturbation start growing in time uh, or not. If it doesn't grow in time, after a little bit it decay, and then the equilibrium state is recovered. So that's a stable state. Uh, a simple example is a pendulum with the mass, uh, you know, just down, and the gravity force uh, and the tension on the rod are uh, in equilibrium. And uh, if you start uh, moving a little bit the pendulum, it will maybe oscillate a little bit, and eventually it will uh, uh, go back to its original position. But the same pendulum, uh, if the mass is on top, is also in equilibrium because the forces are uh, uh, balanced. However, if you perturb it a little bit, clearly it's not going to stay there. It's going to start swinging and go back to the equilibrium state. So uh, this is the main idea. And so the first uh, 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 the first uh, objective is a decision making, uh, if the, st the state is stable or not. And uh, then the next objective is to describe the transition uh, to the new state, and that's really uh, done by nonlinear theory. Linear theory does not tell you uh, what is going on. And it's typically described, well, that's what I wrote here. Nonlinear non theory is often also associated, or it's not referred to, but so with bifurcation theory. So you have a, a, an equilibrium state, which uh, somehow in what, in, in some norm of the solution, uh, is described by, say, zero. Okay, so that's the solution. Uh, that equilibrium is stable up to the green point. It's unstable here. And so that's a bifurcation point where a new solution uh, evolved, and that new solution is probably the stable one, okay? Uh, I say probably because even that has to be proved in principle, because it may not be. The new solution, even though it's more complex, still is subject to perturbation that can change and grow. Um, uh, we will focus on two intrinsic instabilities uh, of combustion, one is the uh, hydrodynamic and the other one the diffusive thermal instabilities. Uh, there are other uh, form of instabilities that I'm not going to discuss uh, in, this, uh, in, in this lecture. Uh, in classical hydrodynamic problems that were uh, very well understood and very well described by uh, the process or this uh, idea of linear theory and then nonlinear theories, for example, the Rayleigh Bernard problem. You have a, a layer of uh, fluid, which is, and, and I, I specifically talk about these 
non-combustion problem to show you the difference and the complication that arise in the combustion problem. So you have a layer of fluid. It's heated from below, so it's hot below and cold on top. And um, well, uh, it can be maintained with no motion, u equal to zero, and a simple um, linear profile of temperature by conduction from the hot to the uh, uh, cold uh, plate. Uh, however, if the temperature difference, for example, increases, or there are some other parameters which are combined in the so-called uh, 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 Rayleigh number, or Grashof number, depending, uh, then uh, what to develop uh, is um, cells, and these cells, which are like this, of the motion, and uh, these cells for sometimes are stable. So this is the bifurcated state, where it occurs at some critical Rayleigh number. And then, in principle, even those become unstable uh, at, at uh, some other, when some condition, uh, uh, some critical condition. Now, uh, you see that uh, this, uh, this uh, the convective cells, of course, it's a more complicated system because now you have motion, so the velocity is not zero, and you have a temperature uh, variation and so on. The point here is that the basic state, which was this, was very simple. And when you perturb it, you get a system of equation which is relatively easier to analyze. In combustion, we don't have any simple system that we can uh, perturb and study its stability. And so we have always to rely on some models that you start from. And so um, the first one will be uh, the uh, model that we have discussed uh, a couple of days ago, which is uh, the hydrodynamic limit, but uh, a la Dario Lando. In other words, uh, uh, with uh, a constant flame speed. Uh, and in fact, this is the analysis that uh, made uh, uh, or uh, is uh, quite famous, which is the Dario Lando instability. So that's what we will describe first. So the idea is that the flame is an interface separate to uh, uh, gases uh, unburned and burned with different densities, and the propagation speed is constant. I don't have to repeat all this. We discussed it before. We solved the Euler equation. If we want to introduce gravity, I will first uh, ignore gravity, and then I will bring it up later. And uh, these are equivalent, we have seen, to the Rankine-Ugoni relation. I told you how they were uh, derived or obtained. And the flame speed, the propagation relative to the flow, is uh, the uh, constant the laminar flame speed. So uh, the basic state, we also have seen this, is a planar flame. Uh, there is a discontinuity in temperature, density, and so on. The velocity must be SL and sigma SL in a frame which is moving with a, with a, in a frame of reference which is attached to the flame, so that the flow in coming, the flame is stationary, and so on, and this is uh, the uh, pressure across the flame uh, in the absence of gravity, you know, that I took gravity out. So if we introduce perturbation, we say that the basic state, the one I wrote before, I denoted by U bar P bar, and the perturbation by U prime P prime V prime, and so on. And so all the primes depend in principle on all the spatial variable and on time. And they are assumed to be small. Formally, if you want, you can put a small parameter, uh, which is um, essentially related to the amplitude of the perturbation. But uh, conventionally, in uh, uh, stability theory, uh, this is, uh, we avoid writing the parameter, we just write the perturbation uh, with the understanding that the magnitude is small compared to the basic state. And so, uh, as you see here, first of all, you substitute that in your equation, but all the nonlinear terms are uh, neglected. In other words, you keep only the linear equation. So that's why it's a linear theory. And so you end up with this set of equations. This is the continuity and the two momentum equation. 
where rho USL uh, comes from, uh, uh, basically, remember in this term, you have U bar, U prime sub X, and so on. So U bar gives you this value, and you know what it is. That's the mass flux into the plane. So the, and this is, by the way, the perturbation, the incoming flow. And the flame is, can be described in this context as X equal to F prime, X equal to zero being the planar flame. Now it's easy to manipulate this equation. Uh, what you do, you uh, differentiate this one with X, this one with Y, and I can show you one of the steps. You get UX sub T and VY sub T, but UX and VY equal to zero, and so uh, that drop and the same thing here. And so you end up with Laplace's equation for the pressure. Uh, once you solve for the pressure, you come to the third equation, you solve for U, and uh, then uh, from the first one, you solve for B. So the steps are quite easy uh, to do, but there's still uh, some PDEs, and so in uh, the, but they are linear, so in principle, PDEs can be solved, for example, uh, uh, by Fourier transform, uh, or uh, Laplace transform in time. Uh, but uh, since it's a linear equation, uh, we can, uh, oh, uh, uh, sorry, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, what is written here is that you also have to uh, linearize not only the uh, equation, but also all the jump condition across the flame. So the propagation speed, uh, the propagation speed to a leading order is gonna be just F prime. Uh, the, uh, the normal is just that because the, the, the quadratic term here are on, uh, nonlinear and so on. So when you substitute in the uh, Rankine-Hugonian relation or their, the equivalent to the Rankine-Hugonian relation or whatever, these are the conditions that you get. U prime is zero, V prime is uh, given by this quantity related to the uh, F prime uh, uh, differentiate with respect to I and P prime is zero. Uh, note one thing that when you perturb a quantity, uh, uh, you have to perturb, um, you see the jumps are evaluated uh, across the surface and not at X equal to zero. So the way to, uh, but this is small, the perturbation is small. So this point can be by Taylor expansion evaluated here and this point here. And so in principle, you can express, uh, it's not replacing, it involved the, 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 the expansion in Taylor expansion, sometimes involved the derivatives or the gradient to first order. And so you can express them as jump relation across the mean position x equal to zero. Okay, and the flame speed gives you this relation. Now I'm gonna uh, use uh, these uh, later to interpret uh, the, the instability. So note one thing, the axial velocity uh, across the mean position, which are these two points, that's what I drew on the blackboard, uh, is actually zero. In other words, there is no discontinuity, but there is a discontinuity in the uh, vertical velocity, in the velocity uh, in the y direction, okay? The, this comes from the fact that the flame is tilted and the normal uh, uh, is uh, affecting the, the jump in the v prime. And uh, then uh, the uh, u prime, which is not, um, uh, is continuous, uh, tells you that uh, the flame, which is the derivative, the propagation speed of the flame, which is the, the derivative of f, is convected with the flow, okay? We will come back to this uh, later. Okay, so, um, uh, as I said, we can use uh, Fourier transform or Laplace transform in time. Uh, so in principle, since it's a linear equation, it's enough to examine one mode, and then any disturbance can be expressed as uh, the, uh, the represent, uh, can be represented as superposition of all the modes. So if we know what any arbitrary mode behave, we, we know the answer for any uh, initial disturbance. So uh, this is expressed in what's known as a normal mode analysis. So you write U prime as uh, e to the iky plus omega t 
a function of x. Uh, why is this allowed? Because the equation are very important to remember this. I have seen papers that were sent to combustion theory and modeling, didn't understand the basic idea and just, exp just wrote exponential off uh, on problems where uh, it's not permitted. <laughs> so the reason that you can use such uh, exponential, it's because um, uh, the equation are constant coefficient. Constant coefficient, as you know from simple ODEs, allow for exponential solution. And it's very similar with the, uh, the equation that we have. Uh, for, so for example, if the basic state is time dependent, and you will see an example of that later, you cannot uh, simply write uh, this form as your uh, normal mode analysis. So um, the, uh, uh, here there is a comment that I will continue to talk about two dimension, but it's very easy to uh, generalize this to three dimension. The interpretation is that uh, uh, the K, which is the uh, wave number, which is the reciprocal of the wavelengths, the wavelengths here is lambda, of the perturbation uh, is instead of being one wave number, you have two wave numbers, and so you have a wave vector, which is the square root of k1 square plus k2 square. So one can do that, but I will keep on focusing on two dimensions. So uh, the next step is that uh, since we have introduced the perturbation in a complex form, e to the i ky, then uh, the equations uh, may lead to uh, a growth rate or omega, which is complex. So omega in general sh can be complex. So it has a real part and an imaginary part. And so when you put that in the expression, for example, of the perturbation of the flame front, uh, I combine the imaginary part and then the real part is here. So uh, the first factor is always bounded, right? Because essentially like sine and cosine, but changing in time and in space. Uh, so the growth rate is determined by the real part of omega, by the real part of omega or omega r. If omega r is positive for all the waves, all k, then the solution is unstable. Uh, I'm sorry. If omega r, <laughs> I stated incorrectly what I wanted to say. If omega r is negative, for all k, in other words, for all waves, all wavelengths uh, have an omega r negative, which means all the waves decay in time, the solution is stable. If omega r is positive for one k, and that's why I restated what I said, if omega r is positive for one k, it means that that mode will grow irrespective even of the others, and therefore the solution is unstable, and in fact dictated by that mode initially. So um, what we are interested now is to solve uh, the Laplace's equation, which after substitute, substituting the normal mode, reduced to a simple system of ODEs, because for example, sec, uh, derivative with respect to i is ik, uh, two derivatives is minus k squared, and so on. So here are the equation, here are the jumps, and that's the flame speed relation. Those equations are quite easy to solve, and I'll do it in a minute, but before doing this, I wanna make a few comments. First comment is, in fact, it's easier to see it here, uh, if P is zero, U is zero, V is zero, A is zero, A, remember, is the amplitude of the perturbation of the flame front, then uh, the solution is zero. In other words, zero is a solution, of course, because zero is the essentially back the equilibrium of the flat flame. So the question that we are asking here, are there non-zero solution of this uh, uh, system of equation? And so we are faced with an eigenvalue problem. Non-trivial solution would correspond to specific values of omega, and omega is the eigenvalue. So we are faced with an, an, an eigenvalue problem. Now you see linear theory is, in, in, in this example is rather simple in the model of, hydro, of Darion Lando, and so it leads to a, a perhaps simple equation. But, and so the, perhaps, uh, as you will see, we can determine the eigenvalues as uh, in a few minutes will be done. But uh, in general, for any other problem, if you have to search for all the eigenvalues 
uh, in, in a complex uh, uh, sp uh, plane, and you have to do it for many parameters. In this case, the parameters uh, are fewer. There is only sigma as a parameter. Then it becomes a cumbersome problem. So in principle, linear theory is not difficult, but it's cumbersome. It may require a big search in the complex uh, plane of the eigenvalues, and it may involve doing this for many parameters. So that's where the problem gets complicated. So, uh, so this is what I wrote here. Uh, when eventually what you will have, it's, uh, it's an eigenvalue problem, and the eigenvalue uh, omega will be determined in terms of the parameters. So you will find a functional dependence that uh, depend on the parameters. The two parameters in this problem is sigma and SL, uh, the wave number, and uh, omega. Sometimes you can... Uh, uh, out of this, uh, sometimes this is written in, a, uh, in, in an Im uh, implicit form, but so you have to analyze this implicit relation, but sometimes you can express it explicitly. Whatever it is, it's referred to as a dispersion relation. It tells you how the growth rate depends on the um, uh, wave number for different parameters. Uh, in uh, the example of Dario and Landau, there are relatively few parameters. Uh, just by dimensional analysis, I can figure out very easily that omega must be of that form, because omega have units of one over a second, speed centimeter per second, k is one over a centimeter. And so the only way that you get a relation between omega and these two parameters is to have uh, uh, them as uh, the product of SL times K with this uh, uh, number here or this quantity which I have referred to, omega Dario lambda would depend on sigma. So I know the answer is like this, okay? In other words, the growth rate. But the, the critical thing is to determine that number if it's positive or negative for what value of sigma and so on. So. Um, the second comment I want to make is that even though I can solve the problem in general, and I will show you that, I will start specifically with uh, the case of sigma minus one small, in other words, a weak thermal expansion. So if we weak thermal expansion, sigma minus one is epsilon, and the equations which were written here simplify a little bit because that, uh, you see all, everything uh, has to be of order epsilon, one can simply see that from looking at the equations, because for example, the jump in V is proportional to sigma minus one, so that's epsilon, so V must be of order epsilon. If V is order epsilon from the continuity equation, U must be of order epsilon from the, this equation, uh, well, from this, uh, from this equation, it's also clear that that's the case, and then uh, P must turn out to be also uh, for the epsilon, but this term will be epsilon squared. So for weak thermal expansion, that term drops, and that's the system you get. And uh, it's a little easier to determine, but uh, there is a reason why I did that, uh, just uh, because I want to use this uh, uh, simpler uh, jump to show you the, uh, uh, the origin of the instability. So when you solve them, uh, you get a solution of this form. Uh, in principle, when you look at the equation for the pressure, it's a second order equation, it has solution e to the kx and e to the minus kx, but of course you have to be uh, imposing that very far at infinity or at minus infinity, the solution uh, uh, decay or die out. So that eliminate one of the uh, two exponents uh, on one or the other side. And when you satisfy all the uh, condition, you get that omega have, uh, uh, is obtained to be exactly this way. Note that it's the same form as before, with sigma minus one over two being the missing uh, constant that uh, uh, before I uh, called the uh, Dario Landau uh, constant. So in, in fact, it's always positive, and so the instability tells, so the analysis tells you that for all wave number, the flame is unstable, the planar flame. Planar flame is unconditionally unstable, and um, 
Uh, this is the reason why I did this uh, weak thermal expansion analysis first, because uh, you can examine that the vorticity, remember I told you in one of the lectures uh, two days ago that uh, uh, the, even though there is a discount, I mean, the, when the flame is treated as a surface of discontinuity, even if the incoming flow is irrotational, there's vorticity produced at the flame uh, when it's not planar. And uh, the, the, the vorticity in this case can be computed, okay, which is essentially the derivative of V with respect to Y uh, with respect to X minus derivative of U with respect to Y, which turn out to be this. And when you evaluate it here, you see it's zero. So in fact, uh, for weak thermal expansion, the vorticity produced is very weak. It's very small. So it's zero to leading order on the burn side, on the underburn side. However, you see that that's uh, it's not true at the interface, and that's uh, the idea that uh, caused me to uh, describe this. So here are the jump. Remember the jump where that u prime is continuous. So u prime at zero plus is equal to u prime at zero minus, and both should be equal to the propagation speed f sub t. That interpreted to the flame front is convected with the flow. In other words, the flow move up, pull with it, right? The, the flame, uh, uh, the flame. Down, down. Uh, the second condition was the jump in V is equal to sigma minus one SL F sub Y. And uh, that show you that there is a discontinuity in the uh, transverse uh, velocity. Now, when you have in the y direction, when, in other words, the velocity in the y direction above and below the mean position is not the same, okay? That, that, is, that means that the sheet, which is the mean location, x equal to zero, uh, is a vortex sheet. In other words, it's a sheet where there is vorticity concentrated on that sheet uh, but the vorticity can be in different direction, and that's exactly what we want to describe. So here is the perturbed sheet. Uh, there is uh, the discontinuity here in velocity tells you that it's minus the slope of f. So if f here has a positive slope, uh, then it means that v prime on top is smaller than v prime at the bottom, and that's what the blue arrow show. On the other hand, here the slope is negative, so the uh, velocity on top is larger than the velocity at the bottom, okay? That implies that, uh, well, and the same thing uh, elsewhere. That implies that, here is the picture I had before, that implies that uh, you have a, a vorticity in this direction in the blue and in this direction in the green. So the vorticity produce a, a flow and that flow the flame is convected with that flow. That flow is uh, directed in this way, okay, due to the direction of the vorticity, and in this region is directed the other way. So basically, the flame get pulled by uh, the vorticity produced at the flame. Now, why did I do the weak uh, gas expansion first, and I didn't do immediately the analysis for sigma general that I will show you in a minute, because in general, the vorticity is not small in the burn and unburn gas, and that's a very nice interpretation, but how do I know what the vorticity in the burn gas does? Maybe it, it dampened uh, the instability or what have you. It's hard to tell. So sometimes interpretation of instabilities, it's not easy to make up. <laughs> Uh, it's always easy to make them up after you know the answer because then you know what the physics that lead to the, or, or at least what result you want to interpret, okay? But uh, in this case, you could interpret it this way with lim the limitation that I have indicated. So here you consider sigma minus one order one, and the difference is the red curves, or the red uh, terms, I mean. And uh, those terms, it's easy to, uh, uh, check that it's related to the vorticity produced in the, uh, in the burn gas. Uh, and, but now we have the solution, so we have to satisfy uh, the jump relation. And you can write them as uh, three or four, it depends if you use A as an unknown or a substitute four. 
um, uh, uh, three equation, a system of three by three, C1, C2, C3 are the constant that appear in the previous equation that need to be determined. And so, and so uh, what uh, you want to solve that system equal to zero. Of course, you're looking for non-trivial solution because when the constants are equal to zero, it means that uh, you obtain no perturbation or the flat flame. And so for non-trivial uh, non solution, the determinant must be zero. Determinant equal to zero give you the dispersion relation, and for uh, the general sigma case, uh, this is the dispersion issue, it's quadratic, and it turned out that omega is uh, uh, real for all uh, wave numbers, so there is no imaginary part in this case to worry about, and so uh, you can solve the quadratic equation. There are two roots. At least one of them is positive, so if one of them is positive, then the uh, flame is always unstable. And uh, this is the coefficient that I have referred before as to omega Darry lambda. It's a positive uh, coefficient for all uh, sigma greater than one. Uh, sigma greater than one is what combustion is about. It's an exothermic reaction. Heat is released, and so the density of the sigma was the density of unburned divided by burn. So density of the Unburn, or burn is smaller than uh, the unburn. Uh, I'm sorry, the other way around. And so, and so you get uh, uh, always. By the way, if you have analyzed an interface uh, like this, but with an endothermic reaction, okay, whatever it's interpreted uh, physically, uh, then uh, the, it would be the opposite. It would be stable, right? Because uh, then. Uh, sigma is less than one, is the one you are interested in. Anyway, this is a minor thing that just mentioned. So uh, the cause for the instability is clearly sigma, and uh, it's the thermal expansion responsible for the instability. By the way, it goes without saying that if you expand this for small, for sigma close to one, you're gonna get the one half sigma minus one that I derived before. Okay, so uh, there is another way to, that appear in the literature that you interpret the instability, but it also has somewhat of a limitation, the same way that I uh, interpreted before with the vorticity uh, or with the vortex sheet. I like the former uh, <laughs> interpretation, but it's, it's up to uh, you, know, you, I guess, how to interpret it. So uh, this is the perturbed uh, flame, you look at uh, a stream tube that have an area uh, A far in the unburned gas, and of course far in the burned gas, uh, it must have also an area A because the far field is not uh, uh, affected or is not. And so, um, uh, and then uh, since uh, the, the streamline have to be uh, deflected towards the burned gas, uh, you must have the picture that is shown here. And since the velocity here, uh, the area is larger, so the velocity is uh, smaller, uh, then uh, the flame will propagate against a smaller velocity and so will propagate further uh, down or faster in, the, in this region and opposite in this region. Uh, so that's fine, but you know, the. Here the problem again that I have used the fact that the velocity and area uh, are related, but that's true only for a steady flow. And this problem is not really steady. So you can argue that if the steadiness or unsteadiness is weak or it's a quasi-steady situation, then it's acceptable. So either case, you have to uh, a little bit make some uh, argument or approximation. So this is the uh, instability, again, for different sigma, uh, the slope grow and the instability is stronger and stronger, but the results are clearly false or incorrect when the perturbation, the wavelength of the perturbation uh, become of the same order of the flame thickness, but in the dairy line theory, the, the, the flame was assumed to be infinite dissimilarly thin, there was no discussion at the time of the structure, and so that limitation 
uh, is not uh, incorporated yet in the analysis. That will come later. So, but nevertheless, despite the fact that this is uh, limited here, in other words, uh, far away here, you expect that these curves will change somehow. Um, then, uh, despite that, the, the instability is dominant in large uh, uh, scale flame, uh, and we're going to see that the effect of diffusion, which comes from the flame thickness, is the one that affects the, uh, uh, the short waves, right? The long waves is always, are always unstable, okay? Now, of course, uh, this have uh, led to the work of Markstein in the 50s and many uh, other people trying to understand the idea of flame stability because, I mean, uh, uh, two prominent scientists have thrown into the community, oh, you know, all the planar flame that you see are always unstable. So it's, it wasn't a comfortable uh, decision or comfortable uh, 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 determination at the time. Um, so, uh, what is, okay, here is some of the consequences. Uh, if you start with a sinusoidal uh, flame, uh, since uh, every point propagates at a constant speed, eventually uh, you uh, develop cusps. So, uh, cusp formation is, a, it's, an, it's naturally the consequence of the, uh, one of the consequences of the instability. And you can see that, for example, in this uh, uh, nice uh, photograph taken from an experiment at Cornell, I believe, uh, at least one of the author from Cornell, uh, the, the flame, it's a V-flame, which is a Bunsen flame, an inverted Bunsen flame stabilized at the rod, uh, the, say, the center of the, of the burner. And uh, it was... Uh, uh, um, it was, uh, uh, the, the, the flow was uh, seeded with some particles that, um, that uh, eventually uh, uh, they, uh, uh, these uh, oil droplets uh, burn and uh, they disappear. So, so the burn gas uh, is uh, the, the bright region. Huh? Is that true or I messed up? Uh, they are consumed in the reaction zone. But anyway, so I don't know. I have to think about it. <laughs> uh, I, I want to move on. One, uh, that's a separation between unburned and burned. And what you see that uh, there is cusps formed uh, on the uh, uh, surface. The image is bright at the reactant as a result of the scattering of laser light uh, of the so so yeah so this is so it's correct this is the unburned and then when they burn uh, they cannot anymore uh, be uh, seen or they don't have uh, the image is no longer bright and that's the burn but the arrow showed the same place on <laughs> burn and burn and that's not what I intended so this is the burn tree okay uh, here are another example of formation of cusp and creases. Uh, in a turbulent flame, that's a very old uh, paper, uh, Fox and Weinberg, but I'm sure that you will see in more recent uh, photograph a very similar uh, picture. And that's an example that I told you when we talked about uh, uh, Bunsen flame, and it was taken from paper by Uberoy. Remember I told you as you uh, increase the flow, then the angle right, of the Bunsen flame increases, but when you decrease the flow towards the laminar flame speed, it decrease. You expect from at least the theory, but from even just physical argument, that when the uh, velocity will be equal to the laminar flame speed, the flame will be flat. But it turned out that it never become flat. It become a little curved all the time, and that's due to the, uh, again, with some cusps here, and that's again due to the Darry Landau instability. Flame in tubes are typically curved, convex towards the unburned gas. Again, another uh, um, consequence of the instability. Now we are adding gravity, and if you remember the solution of the planar flame, when you add gravity, include 
the hydrostatic uh, pressure at density rho u and density rho b for the unburned and burned gas, respectively. Okay? And uh, at the time when we uh, derived this, I told you that uh, this is written for when g is positive is downwards, in other words, the flame propagating uh, in the direction of gravity. Uh, and if you want to describe the flame propagating upward, then in principle you have to change the coordinate x to negative x, but it's equivalent in this uh, uh, writing to change the sign of g, uh, keep the coordinate as is. So g positive correspond to downward propagation, g negative correspond to upward propagation. You can, of course, uh, you can call g always positive because it's 9.8. <laughs> Uh, meter per second square and change the sign in the equation. But think of g as a parameter which is equal to plus or minus the absolute value of g. Okay, so uh, that's uh, fine. Uh, in uh, Remember I told you that in all the jumps that you um, uh, determine, you have to, um, uh, you have to uh, use the Taylor expansion uh, to evaluate the value across the surface to the mean position. So, for example, uh, if u has to be evaluated at x equal to, say, uh, f, f being the perturbation, then uh, it's uh, equal to u at x equal to 0 plus uh, d u dx, and this u will be the uh, basic state at x equal to zero multiplied by the perturbation, which is f plus higher terms, right? That's the Taylor expansion. Now, uh, since uh, the basic state, uh, the u bar is a constant and the derivative is zero, so uh, this really uh, didn't show up explicitly or that uh, uh, expansion didn't show up explicitly in the analysis until now. But in the pressure term, it does. Because you see the perturbation of the equation, gravity does not show up, OK? It's, it's just a constant. So when you add a perturbation, there is nothing that gets perturbed from the term rho g. Rho is assumed to be constant, unburned, and burned. So where does gravity show up? Gravity show up when you does the jump in p, uh, because then you have a derivative uh, like this derivative, dp bar dx, and dp bar dx is either rho ug or rho bg, and so that gives you that uh, jump in the pressure across the mean position of the plane. Okay, so when you add this to your analysis, you have uh, an additional term here which show up due to gravity. Still, it's a quadratic equation. You can uh, write the solution. There are two solutions. One of them is always positive, so the flame is also always unstable. Remember that we are talking about infinite uh, uh, wide uh, flame, and so there is always perturbation that will grow, and that's the, uh, uh, the answer. Okay, but it's important to try to understand uh, what does gravity affect, the long wave or the short waves? And so, uh, here is the expansion that we had before. The first question is, what happens if, if I analyze short waves? Short waves correspond to small, uh, large, I'm sorry. Yeah, sh uh, short waves is l uh, large k, correct. It's the inverse of lambda, okay? And see, even I sometimes get confused, especially when I try to talk fast. So uh, k is uh, large. So if k is large in, in this expression, uh, then, uh, yeah, uh, k, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, no, uh, it's correct. So if k is large in, in this expression, uh, this term in the square root is small compared to the k square because that's proportional, to, that's just k, k square. So in the square root, uh, uh, you only have the k square, this term is gone, and so the end result 
uh, this term is comparable because when you take the square root, and that's why I hesitated for a minute, uh, when you take the square root, this is going to be proportional to k, and this one proportional to k. So the Taylor expansion of omega for, uh, for a large k or short waves is this. So you see that gravity does not affect the short waves, okay? What about the long waves? Uh, or the influence of gravity dies out when k become larger and larger. Uh, what about the long waves? Long waves is small k. Well, small k, then it's um, uh, k squared, which is negligible, right? So if k squared is negligible, you see the first term in the square root is negative, so it, it can be written as, minus, as i, the square root of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the value without the sign. And so here it is, i times the square root. Uh, then uh, I brought that sigma plus 1 inside the bracket and so on. And so, um, uh, and so it depends. Uh, so this is the answer, but it depends if g is positive or negative. So when g is positive, uh, this term is imaginary, and so you have to go to the next term to determine the real part of omega, and the next term is negative, and so the flame is going to be stable. So long wave, uh, gravity will stabilize. What about the short waves? Uh, I'm sorry, what about the downward propagation, G negative? G negative makes this still positive, so it's always unstable. So downward propagation, Long waves can be stabilized by gravity. Short waves remain unstable due to the hydrodynamic instability. This is basically the conclusion here, but it also gives you an idea uh, from the analysis how long and short should the wave be, and uh, you can easily obtain uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, inequality. Okay, so what are the questions to address after having uh, uh, understood the origin of the diary lambda or the hydrodynamic instability is um, uh, what happened if uh, the wavelength is of the order of the flame thickness, in other words, to try to understand the influence of the flame structure on the instability. The second thing is uh, if uh, uh, perturbation grow, what do they grow to, okay? What is the nonlinear consequences? You see, linear theory can sometimes give you an idea or a hint what may happen, but it doesn't ex conclusively tell you what is going to happen. So you have to analyze that. And also, it tells you only what happened in the initial stages when the perturbation is small. When, to, when the perturbation become large, uh, things could be different. And finally, uh, a question that I will address in the third lecture of today, what could be the influence of the instability on turbulent flames? And so uh, the next uh, study is uh, uh, focus on thermodiffusive instability. The idea uh, is that there probably are instabilities uh, which are um, associated with the diffusion effect in, inside the flame. Incidentally, this instability is very similar, or it has the same origin as the so-called Turing instability. Turing is the famous Turing uh, of uh, the, the first, uh, I don't know, computer electronic machine. Uh, there was a nice movie about him. <laughs> and so it's the same Turing. He did a very uh, classical paper, despite uh, being focused on other things, on instability of uh, uh, different diffusivity, not in the context of flames, but uh, in different contexts. So, um, uh, so what we have seen from the Darry lando instability is that when sigma grow, uh, then the instability is stronger and stronger. We, what we want is to perturb the flame, but to filter out the hydrodynamic instability because they are unstable always, and so they are gonna be disturbing the analysis of the other thermodiffusive effect. In the next lecture, I will show you how a more comprehensive theory that uh, combined the two effects. So uh, in order to, fill the, to filter them out, we take sigma equal to one. Then we know that 
hydrodynamic uh, effect are not going to affect the flame, and we study the other effect. So this is effectively like assuming constant density. So now what is the model that we will analyze? The model we will analyze is the equation for the temperature and concentration uh, with uh, different diffusivities. So here you have lambda over rho Cp, thermal diffusivity. Here you have the molecular diffusivity. Of course, I put them in soon in a dimensionless form, and uh, it's going to introduce the Lewis number. Uh, but that's a complicated system, this reactive diffusive system, because uh, the nonlinearity uh, of the reaction uh, term, and so uh, how to study this. And so again, we have to use a simpler model, and the model we're going to use is the uh, large activation energy uh, model where the uh, flame uh, is, um, I'm sorry, the reaction is replaced by a reaction sheet, and uh, we uh, have derived more or less, or at least I generalized, jump condition across the reaction sheet. Uh, and so that's the model we are going to use. And so the equation essentially uh, first are made dimensionless, so that the only parameter that appears here is going to be the Lewis number, which is the thermal to, to, to mass diffusivity. Note that I have used only a single reactant. so. The idea is that the molecular diffusivity is the molecular diffusivity of the deficient reactant in the mixture, okay? And uh, in the large activation energy approximation, the flame temperature is just an exponential and a constant, and this is like so. And so, um, uh, again, uh, by the way, there is an assumption here. It's not always uh, uh, explicitly stated and so on, but uh, when you replace the reaction zone in, uh, as a discontinuity, the uh, implicit uh, assumption here is that disturbances uh, are uh, of wavelength which are larger always than the reaction zone. In other words, you did not, uh, uh, we're not uh, going to say anything about disturbances of uh, uh, the wavelengths which are comparable to the reaction zone. That's, in fact, difficult also to analyze because the reaction zone is very small. Even numerically, it takes you have to take m many uh, points in that region to describe. And uh, there have been some attempt analytically to discuss uh, something related to this. But uh, it seems like, at least from the knowledge today, that it's not important. In other words, the results are not affected significantly by that. Okay. I already said that the Lewis number must be uh, defined as such, and that's the way to interpret the result. That's why it's very important to stick to whatever uh, uh, the definition of the, those terms in the theory. Otherwise, you're not comparing apple to apple. Uh, the, also, there is a minor, uh, and I say minor because today we probably know that it's not affecting much, assumption that is made in order to do the analysis mathematically rigorously or systematically is to assume a distinguished limit that the Lewis number is near one. The reason that I say it's not a very important one because we know that when you take this uh, small deviation of the Lewis number from one that I called little le, uh, if you take it to large value, there is no uh, some non-uniformities that get created in the equation that causes changes. So it seems like you can take this Le to be quite large, which will correspond to most Lewis number that you are interested uh, in combustion problem, and it's it's uh, it's probably okay. Uh, I say probably because I don't have a proof of that, but it's a it's the sense when you study those problems. So again, you perturb your equation. Uh, T is T bar, which is the basic state plus the perturbation. Omega is going to be the dispersion relation. And since the problem depends on a single um, uh, parameter, which is the Lewis number here, the deviation from 1, uh, I will keep on calling it the Lewis number, but remember that that's what it is. And the, wave num and the wave number k. And so again, we write uh, uh, equations um, as uh, um, uh, 
um, uh, this is the flame front, uh, the amplitude, and omega is split into real and imaginary part. And again, the question is, what is the real part of the growth rate omega? Just want to uh, uh, stop for a minute and just make one comment, then continue. Uh, remember that when we derived the uh, large activation energy approximation for the planar flame, we did not have to assume constant density was done for any density. So you may ask me why then you don't use that as the basic state and perturb it and study uh, its stability. The answer is very simple, that uh, when you incorporate uh, thermal expansion uh, in the basic state, uh, then the perturbation equation or the linear equation that you obtain from the linear analysis are with variable coefficients. Variable coefficient, I don't know how to solve, even though they are ODEs. So you can do it numerically. And there was one study numerically, which I will refer to uh, in the next lecture, OK? But the first type of study that illuminated on the problem were done uh, with the constant density uh, approximation. OK, so. You end up with a dispersion relation when you open it up, analyze it, and so on. The steps in this uh, uh, analysis are not as easy as the Dari Lando. They are actually quite compli complicated, but they lead to a, a cubic. B naught omega cube, B1 omega square, B2, B3. All those Bs are known. They were obtained from the analysis. And they, of course, depend on the two parameters, the Lewis number and the wave number. And so the next uh, analysis is to try to uh, examine uh, the cubic and stability and stability. By the way, it's, uh, it's not very difficult to establish before what I do here, uh, or what I will show you here, uh, where are the roots positive and negative. There is a Ruth Hollitz condition that can be used uh, that tells you that uh, based on some combination of these coefficients, you know if omega is real or not. But uh, in general, uh, what I will do here, I will assume that omega is equal, not minus. That's a typo. Sorry about that. Omega is omega real plus i omega i. Uh, you substitute that in the cubic, and of course, you get two relations because you need to determine omega r and omega i. So marginal stability, in other words, if the curve that will uh, determine one side is negative, one side is positive, is the curve omega equal to 0. And omega equal to 0, you substitute here, you get two relations, one from the top, one from the bottom. Okay, And so uh, if omega i is 0, uh, by the way, what does omega i uh, represent? Uh, when you, uh, I, actually it will be later also written, So, but let me just uh, if, if k is not zero, then the perturbation uh, f will be proportional to something like this. So when uh, i, when omega i is not zero, let's say k equal to zero, that represent uh, just a, uh, an oscillation in time. So it's, it's, it's a flame which will be pulsating, basically. A flat flame is just pulsating, because k, there is k equal to 0. It's flat, so it's pulsating. If uh, k uh, is not 0, then that will, prop that will be like a wave that propagates along the surface. Okay. Uh, in fact, it will come uh, in uh, the soon in the discussion. Sorry, I jumped here. Uh, so, um, so when omega i is equal uh, to 0, this relation is satisfied. This one uh, uh, is uh, equal to 0. So the marginal stability curve corresponds to b3 equal to 0. You take b3, you get a, an equation that in the plane of Lewis number versus wave number, it's represented by this. Uh, um, red uh, curve. I will graph it in a minute. Uh, stability boundary 
uh, for uh, what? Louis Tambor less than the oil. What I meant is that the it will be it's unstable when uh, Louis number. I don't know what I meant with this. Forget that. That's the curve. Uh, I can think about it. I think I know. Uh, it's going to be in the negative side. Oh yeah, because you cannot. Uh, this relation must imply uh, that Lewis number is negative, right? Otherwise, you cannot satisfy. Uh, if omega i is not zero, then you have two relations to satisfy. One of them gives you the frequency of this wave of those pulsation, and the other one gives you the stability boundary. And here is the frequency of the pulsation, and here is the stability boundary. Now, the red and blue curve are described here. The red curve is just simple uh, parabola in the K versus Lewis number uh, plane. Uh, it touch minus 2 here when K equal to 0. And the blue curve is a curve here uh, which is shown uh, uh, with uh, where omega i is not zero. In other words, uh, the instability here will be associated with some pulsation or uh, uh, wave propagation. Um, the growth rate in this region, uh, it depends if it's uh, greater or less than minus two. So if it's greater than minus two, which means when you are here, uh, you see that it immediately decay. It's all, they are all negative for all k, so this region is stable, okay? The f I told you that using a Roos-Hovitt condition, you can establish a priori that this is the stable region and those are the unstable, but you have to analyze the entire uh, uh, system uh, and make the conclusion. Uh, when uh, Lewis number is a little less than minus two, uh, remember, minus 2 would correspond to a Lewis number a little less than 1, right? 1 minus 2 beta or something like that. Uh, this is the deviation from 1. Uh, and so this is what, uh, uh, so you see there are um, long waves uh, which are unstable, but eventually the very short waves become stable. Uh, in this uh, region, uh, those are the uh, curves that des describe the growth rate. Uh, of course, uh, if you are here, then the uh, transition occur at this point. In other words, if k equal to zero, if you force your flame to always be flat, then uh, somehow, I don't know how you always do that, but it depends. Uh, for example, if you use a flat flame burner, uh, although there is heat losses that I will talk about it in a few minutes, but um, uh, you can force it to uh, be flat, let's say, then, uh, then the instability that you observe is pulsation. In fact, this was observed on a flat flame burner, but it was not observed for more freely propagating flame, this pulsation. And uh, the reason for that is because this number, which is approximately 10, will make a Lewis number, which is like, one plus 10 beta will be some bigger than two, three, and so that's seldom uh, you have mixture that have that large uh, uh, Lewis number. On the other hand, it was observed in solids, in propagation, flame propagation in a solid that uh, 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 the flame propagate and the burn, the burn material is also a solid. Um, and uh, because the Lewis number is practically infinite, there is very small diffusion in the solid, and so the denominator, right, thermal divide by mass, the denominator is uh, very small, Lewis number is very large, almost infinite. And indeed, there are instabilities that were observed in, in, in solid, and it's a useful, uh, a uh, way to run a flame through a solid because you can create a product uh, with more uniform properties uh, of the solid uh, that you are interested in and uh, that's used in uh, material processing, for example. Uh, okay, so this is uh, uh, the two uh, form the instability. Here, in fact, I am re-explaining what I sort of said that on, uh, on the board. Uh, the nature of the instability can be inferred from the linear theory 
at the neutral state. In other words, when omega real is zero, not growing, not decaying, so it gives you an idea what may be the instability that de developed thereafter. And so, uh, but the, the full description of the new state required nonlinear theory, and I will discuss some of that in the next lecture. So here is the perturbation. If omega r is zero, then uh, this is what uh, the form of the shape of the flame at marginal stability. Uh, if, um, uh, if omega i is zero, right? Then uh, A is of the form E to the I K Y, which is like sine and cosine in space, so that form like cells. So the origin of this instability on the left side, right, when Lewis number is sufficiently negative, it leads to cellular flames. Uh, when omega I is uh, not zero, then you can, or, or I talked about that already, you can have either pulsating flame, if K remains zero, very small, in other words, when the waves are long, and uh, uh, or a traveling wave along the flame surface, and uh, you can, in fact, from the linear theory, gives an idea of uh, the propagation speed of those waves, uh, which is going to be omega i over K, and we had an expression for omega i. Okay, uh, this is then the picture you see steady cells that are created, those are steady, right? Because omega i is zero. So the, at least in the transition or what uh, the theory tells you that you will be transitioning into steady cells. But to determine that indeed that's the case, you have to study the bifurcation and to show that the new uh, state that develop are steady cells. Um, and on the right here, you get either pulsation. Uh, this is not taken from a pulsation of these of primix flame, but anyway, I put it in just for the picture. And that's taken from Markstein uh, monograph, and uh, you see effectively the traveling waves along the surface. Again, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be identical for that region. It was for illustrative purpose. Uh, cellular flame can be, uh, one can give an explanation for this. I don't know and I have never seen an explanation for uh, pulsation, a simple explanation. It's complicated because you have to somehow talk about the uh, uh, time scale of uh, the perturbation and the oscillation. Uh, you can make up something, but uh, you know, usually those uh, uh, a, a simple explanation are useful if you can make them a priori. If you can make them a posteriori, it's only nice for maybe explanation, but no more. One of the simple things that you can always easily uh, uh, give an interpretation is uh, a, a, heavy, uh, uh, a heavy fluid on top of a light, because what you do, you take a small parcel of the fluid, you said you have a perturbation, uh, it's, uh, it's moved up, and now you, you compare the buoyancy uh, uh, there, and you say, well, it'll have to go down, or it doesn't have to go down. So this is easy to interpret. But a uh, complicated system is not very easy. But anyway, a cellular flame can be uh, explained. The idea is that a, a, a flat flame, the isotherm, or the, constant, or the iso surface of Y are straight line. I'm focusing on the isotherms here, uh, but when you have a perturbation, okay, then, uh, then of course the isotherm are slightly perturbed, perturbed, perturbed. If you go sufficiently far to the left where the a mixture is uniform, then it will be flat, all right? And so uh, uh, what you see is there is a sharp gradient here and uh, less uh, gradient here. The, the, the more dense the isotherms are, there is a sharper gradient. Now, uh, when uh, the diffusivities are in balance, uh, then uh, the same uh, heat conduction in this direction and mass diffusion in this direction uh, are, uh, are in balance, and so there is no any uh, effect from the, the, you know, they're in balance and they 
they then the the plane will retain its planar uh, form. There is no instability that you expect to be developed. When they are not in balance, then more mass is diffusing towards the flame, less heat is conducted away, and so naturally the flame will propagate faster. And so this section will propagate faster than this section, than this section, and that leads to instability. People sometimes call, uh, call it focusing, but it's the same thing. Okay, uh, just uh, the Lewis number, if you compute the Lewis number for, say, propane air mixture or hydrogen air mixture, uh, you will see that the Lewis number uh, uh, from lean to rich uh, goes from large number like 1.8 to 0.9, and for hydrogen from 0.37 to one, say, 95. It depends how uh, that's for fee equal to two. Anyway, those are s some estimates of this fact. The main point here is that um, uh, since the cells, cellular flame would appear when the Lewis number is sufficiently less than one, then you expect them uh, in uh, lean hydrogen air and in rich hydrocarbon air. And indeed, that's what has been observed uh, in flame. Uh, one, uh, an, an, another nice thing that you can actually determine from the analysis, since uh, we have focused on the growth rate, but of course when you do the linear analysis, you also obtain uh, solutions for the concentration, the temperature, and so on. So this is the temperature perturbation, in particular the flame temperature perturbation. That came out of the analysis, and it shows that the temperature at the crests, when viewed from the burn gas, uh, is lower than the troughs uh, uh, at the troughs. The temperature is larger than the adiabatic temperature, in other words, the sign of this quantity. So it shows that the temperature here is weaker than the temperature here, and that's what you also observed in uh, experiment. Here is, for example, this is taken from Markstein, it's a cellular flame uh, formed in a slot burner so that it's effectively two-dimensional, okay? And uh, finally, effect of, uh, due to heat losses, uh, have shown that uh, it reduced, so as you increase the heat loss, the region of the Lewis number which was stable become uh, narrower and narrower. Uh, this is taken from Julien and Clavin. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, uh, so, so that explains why uh, I told you that these pulsating flames are usually not seen uh, uh, in freely propagating flame, but they can be observed in Bunsen flames, uh, in flat flame, because then the heat loss uh, reduce the range of instability and bring uh, uh, the, into a regime where you can observe them. Uh, I think that's it. So uh, let's have a break and we will continue afterwards. Interesting stuff, so I don't feel like <laughs> cutting them off. Anyway, uh, what we are going to do first is uh, see a, a more comprehensive theory, and what I mean by this is a theory that includes both. Uh, hydrodynamic and diffusive thermal effect. To some extent, you will see even that theory is limited, unfortunately, and uh, who knows who is going to... Uh, I'm too old to do the next step in it, but maybe some younger people will one day. Um, so the, the, uh, we talked about the uh, Dario Landau result, uh, which was essentially uh, uh, linear growth uh, in wave number, which is always unstable, and I question uh, what happened uh, uh, for the short waves. Uh, Markstein idea, as I said uh, in one of the earlier um, uh, discussions, uh, was to introduce a dependence on curvature, and then came the asymptotic results in the 80s, early 80s, that have shown essentially uh, what is the next term is what you can think of, 
the, uh, not think, but what is, uh, the, if you like, the, the Taylor expansion of the exact dispersion relation in powers of uh, wave number k. So uh, what we have the next term in k square, uh, which is uh, represented here, and it turned out that the next term, because it came from the analysis of the flame structure, is proportional to the flame thickness with a coefficient b that depend now on sigma, which is the gas expansion, but also on the Lewis number in the mixture. And uh, the Lewis number here is the effective Lewis number as I have defined it in the discussion of hydrodynamic theory a couple of days ago. And so this is the result of these uh, studies. They were expressed in different notation, different things, and so on, but they are all equivalent. The idea is that the term, which is proportional to k square, include three factors. The first one is B1. Uh, by the way, uh, in, the, in the derivation, B1, B2, uh, analytic expression were the, the, uh, obtained for this coefficient. So they are known. I will not write them because it's not going to be adding anything uh, uh, in the discussion. So we know B1, B2, B3. And the, the way that they are written after putting the right sign here and the right sign here, they are all positive, okay? So uh, they depend on gas expansion, they are all positive, and omega dl is the dairy lando uh, uh, coefficient which we have derived before. So the first term uh, is always stabilizing because you see it's a negative. All the positive terms are stabilizing, negative terms are destabilizing, okay? So, and it can be easily seen that it's associated with heat conduction. Heat conduction tend to smear temperature differences and so tend to stabilize the flame. On the, on the other extreme, there is viscous diffusion. So viscous diffusion also turn out to be stabilizing influence on the flame. Uh, by the way, the analysis here assumes that uh, the, um, Viscous of the, the viscosity of the burn gas and unburned gas is not the same, is different and uh, depend on temperature, so it's different. Uh, but um, uh, the early analysis that were done with constant viscosity, in other words, not taking this account, shown that uh, this term is zero. So in other words, the effect of viscosity come due to the temperature dependence of the viscosity or the effect of the viscous term. Anyway, uh, the middle term is the one which is interesting because it has a Lewis number minus one, and so it can change sign. And so when Lewis number effective is bigger than one, then uh, the species diffusion are stabilizing. When it is less than one, it's destabilizing. This is not to say that Lewis number equal to one is the critical value because the critical value is where this whole omega change the sign from positive to negative. And I will write it down in a minute, uh, maybe. Uh, I just alluded to it. So uh, if we focus on, uh, if, if we analyze this, we, I call this whole uh, B, right? Uh, when the Lewis number is uh, bigger than one, this is negative. And so this is a parabola like the green curve, okay? So, and uh, the slope for uh, small k will be exactly the slope of the dairy land instability. And so it showed that uh, the um, short waves here, which are sh the waves larger than this value are stabilized by diffusion. And uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, so this is the dispersion relation that you obtained. In other words, if somehow you eliminate the long waves, then the flame can be stable. How do you eliminate the long waves? There are different possibilities. One, if your burner uh, is limited in size, then uh, uh, waves longer than the width are not affecting the flame. And so those are eliminated. Another possibility is gravity. We know that long waves can be uh, affected by gravity, can be stabilized by gravity, and so if you include gravity in this analysis, you're gonna get a totally stable flame. What about the uh, Lewis number less than 
the effective value that caused B, first of all, it caused B to be negative, but omega to be negative, then this expression will have a positive sign here, and uh, this uh, curve will start going up. What happened? I just told you a minute ago that the theory is not complete. In principle, you expect that there will be some kind of stabilization in the short, uh, in the very short waves, but uh, nobody have computed uh, this except in some cases numerically, and there are some recent uh, uh, numerical studies uh, uh, in uh, coming from Aachen that uh, try to determine uh, uh, that uh, cur uh, that curve, but we have done that uh, earlier. Uh, in, in a study uh, at uh, EPFR, uh, no, uh, in uh, ETH, and uh, this show that here you see the, the, uh, the, the theory, the theory, and the uh, uh, numerics. But this was for one particular mixture under some specific conditions. See, that's the difference between theory and the numerics. The numerics will be good, but they cannot span an entire parameter range as I showed you uh, the expression before. But anyway, the anticipation is then probably true. Okay, um, neutral stability curve can be written when omega is equal to zero. That would be like what distinguish between stable and unstable flame. Uh, note that I uh, draw here, I drew here the, uh, the, 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 the stability curve that I have shown you uh, from the thermal diffusive instability, in other words, from the constant density model, it was go to minus two, remember? And uh, so if you uh, uh, plot uh, now this from the just expression that I just gave you a minute ago, you get a, a sort of a hyperbola, uh, which is uh, just this. So you see, what you get is that the long waves are always unstable, that's a Dari Lando instability. Right? But uh, what's interesting is that uh, this curve tends to the same curve of the minus two, so there is a consistency and there is a nice blending of the different analysis. Uh, now, I did mention that there was one numerical study that was done using the large activation energy solution, but then uh, it cannot uh, give you an analytical expression for this dispersion relation because the equation are variable coefficients and then they had to be solved numerically. So they were solved on one side of the flame, the other side of the reaction, of the reaction sheet, and with the jump condition accordingly. And uh, this is the neutral curve that they obtain. And uh, note that they have compared to the analytical expression, and at least this part of the curve is very, is very uh, the, there is a nice agreement between the two. What it shows you also is something about the nature of the, this, uh, at least this branch doesn't vary much due to thermal expansion, uh, but the main effect is the fact that the long waves become unstable. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, when you Increase heat loss again. I mentioned the consequence. It reduces the regime of stable flames. Uh, I also mentioned that you can. Uh, uh, so, so the, I, uh, I mentioned that before. Quickly, uh, I repeat: if you write. Um, Uh, well, I mean, th this was the dispersion relation, basically, omega equal to. Uh, so uh, if you equate it equal to zero, you obtain the uh, critical value here, which is, I think, denoted by Km. In other words, what the intention here was to say that uh, if K uh, is uh, larger than some Km, then uh, the, the flame will be always uh, stable. In other words, if you can eliminate the long waves, it can be stable, and you can do that with gravity because gravity stabilizes uh, the, uh, the long waves, and so you would obtain curves which are uh, always in the stable regime. Uh, so you can examine, uh, you can look at this in the literature, I won't discuss them, 
Uh, these results were taken from uh, uh, early experiment done in Marseille uh, by Quinar and uh, Serbi and uh, so on, uh, in collaboration with Paul Clavin. And uh, the, the, this show a, a, an actually flat flame uh, in a almost, uh, 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 in, not on a burner, but on top of a very large tube. Uh, I think it was about eight centimeter, yeah? And uh, they were able to establish a nice plain flame, and then they uh, perturb it, uh, they change the, the equivalence ratio, and they obtained the onset of cells. You see it start developing uh, here. Uh, this is uh, very close to the onset of in the instability. Later on, uh, you obtain this very nice cellular pattern, but this is already in the nonlinear regime, okay? Uh, the, uh, one more effect that I wanted to show here is that uh, fl flat flame in a counterflow uh, or in stagnation point of flow are known to be very stable. You see them experimentally, and the reason for this is the effect of stretch or strain, and so when you add effect of strain, uh, you see that uh, the epsilon equal to zero is no, str uh, no strain, you know, it's the result that I showed before, and you see there is the, 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 the hydrodynamic instability here, in other words, the long waves, that's K, long waves are unstable, but as you uh, increase epsilon, the strain rate, this curve turn around, okay? So there is a region here which is absolutely stable, and that's where uh, uh, you observe those uh, flames. Okay. Next is cellular flames. So uh, here is, you have a, originally, a, a, I'm sorry, I say cellular, a spherically expanding flame. So here you have a, a, a flame which uh, is uh, growing in time. Spherical flame that grow in time. So first of all, there are already quite few complications. The uh, which actually it's the next slide. Uh, the perturbation to be seen experimentally, they have to grow faster than the flame itself. Otherwise, uh, the perturbation will not be seen because the flame has grown faster. So already, when you talk about stability, it's not as simple. As was discussed before, you put the growth rate and you ask, does it grow, it doesn't grow. So it has to grow. So you have to do it, the growth rate relative to the flame. The second question is, uh, in principle, the definition of stability in, in, in mathematically has a very simple dis discussion. You perturb the equilibrium. Uh, let's say the perturbation is e to the omega t. Uh, and then you ask whether the perturbation as t goes to infinity goes to zero, which means that you recover the basic state. Well, here, the solution is all the time unsteady, uh, all the time evolving in time. So how do you determine uh, stability? So the only way to discuss stability or instability is to talk about the momentary, momentary tendency for the flame to grow bigger or not, okay? So it's a, like a momentary instability. Uh, and uh, this is a picture actually from uh, this John of perturbed flame. Now in a spherical coordinate, uh, you have to use coordinate r, theta, and phi. And so if you perturb r equal to r of t, uh, you have to, uh, first of all, the growth rate uh, is no longer e to the omega t because uh, an equation, uh, I don't know if you can see this, an equation, even a simple differential equation with variable coefficients a, b, c does not satisfy, uh, does not have sort of growing exponential solution. Only when a, b, c are constant, uh, you have exponential solution. So you have to allow for a to be a function of time and determine it as part of the solution. Uh, it turned out that the right behavior is uh, an algebraic dependence on time, not, uh, not exponential. And the second thing is that uh, you don't write e to the i, k, y, because those are not the modes in spherical coordinates. The proper modes are the spherical harmonics, uh, uh, which uh, are uh, a combination of e to the i, m, phi, and uh, uh, gender 
uh, associated, actually, a genre of polynomial uh, P and M, uh, which is sometimes denoted by. It doesn't matter now for the discussion here. What uh, you do, you perturb the equation, the linearized equation, and um, this is the, effectively the relation that you get. 1 over a dA dt actually represents the relative growth. That's, no, that's not stretch, a is not area. 1 over a is the amplitude, so 1 over a dA dt is the gr relative growth of the amplitude. Okay, so uh, it's obtained as 1 over r dr dt, which is the relative growth of the flame, multiplied by this coefficient. And uh, it turned out that the omega here is effectively related to the hydrodynamic instability. It's not exactly the same relation like for a planar flame, but you can see that it always grow. Uh, uh, so it always grow for all waves, so uh, almost for all waves. So it uh, it uh, it represents the hydrodynamic instability. And the second term, which is proportional to the flame thickness. Uh, incorporate terms which are like before heat conduction, uh, viscous diffusion, and uh, 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 mass, uh, uh, mass, mass diffusion. And uh, these, again, uh, coefficients depend on sigma and on n. n represent the uh, wave number on that, uh, uh, on that spherical plane. Okay, so the result looks uh, uh, similar, but of course they need to be interpreted properly. And so what you obtain when the Lewis number uh, is uh, bigger than the critical value, similar to the discussion uh, before, what you obtain, you start from initially from some perturbation, and you see that it starts decaying before it grows. So it decay up to a certain uh, radius and then it starts growing. So initially, the perturbation seems to decay relative to the growing flame, and then the perturbation grow faster than the flame, and so you can now uh, determine where your instability is. So mathematically, you can say instability grow when after you reach the minimum because that's when it starts growing. It's not clear that experimentally you're going to see exactly those small changes there. Maybe you see it when this is a bit bigger, uh, the amplitude is at least of the size of the initial amplitude and so on, but eventually it will be seen. Uh, I point that out because, again, uh, you cannot, if you want to compare things, you have to be careful what you compare. You have to know what the analysis tells you. Now, this is for loose number bigger than one. And by the way, note that uh, these are different modes. So there is one that is growing the fastest, or the first one to grow. OK, not, I didn't say correct. Not the fastest, it's the first one to grow. And then the other start growing as well. And you see that later on, there is even interaction of modes, so it's not clear uh, that linear theory described those interactions properly. So um, uh, this is uh, uh, just that. Now, this number turned out to be at about n equal to 12 or 13. Uh, I'll show you that in the next uh, one of the next figure. What it says is that uh, the flame will be uh, uh, nicely smooth, sphere, 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 and then suddenly you have instantaneously you have many cells on it. It's not one and then two and then three. Immediately, you have n equal to 13. Whatever corresponds to n equal to 13 is the number of cells that you're going to see. What happens when Lewis number is less than the critical value? Remember, in the, uh, in the planar case, we said that we only know that the flame will be uh, more unstable due to the diffusive thermal effect. And uh, uh, what here it says that, well, it starts growing immediately in the analysis. But remember, the analysis here is based on the hydrodynamic model, which says that the flame thickness is small compared to the flame size. And so when the flame is very small, the analysis doesn't hold. And so what this may suggest that perhaps if you started with a perturbation of the, uh, uh, when the flame was 
uh, very small of the order of the flame thickness, then it may have decay a little bit and then grow, and now we are catching only the growth. In other words, we don't know, we don't have a theory that describes this part. So it's very complicated because you have really to uh, solve the full equation on the diffusion scale. Okay, so uh, this is that. Uh, well, this is what I wrote here. And when Lewis number is bigger, all the stubs are damp initially. Uh, actually, I said 13. It's a, it turned out it's 16. I missed a little bit, but it's the same idea. Um, so the in mixture with Lewis number bigger than a critical value, which would correspond to lean hydrogen or rich, hyd uh, I'm sorry, lean hydrocarbon or rich hydrogen. And uh, in such mixture, we know the, that the flame would remain smooth initially and eventually spontaneously take on a cellular appearance when it reaches a critical value and a critical radius. And the instability is due to thermal expansion with the stabilizing influence due to diffusion effect. By the way, note that as the flame grow bigger and bigger, uh, then the uh, effect here uh, becomes smaller and smaller, and so you expect that for large flame, the flame will be hydrodynamically unstable, which is equivalent to the Dairy Lando instability. Uh, these are neutral stability curve, uh, the wave number versus the Peckle number. Peckle number is effectively, in this case, is essentially the radius, which change in time. So there is a minimum radius, uh, to the left, the flame is stable. By the way, this is for Lewis number greater than the critical, and that's my discussion from now on until the end of the day today will be only on Lewis number bigger than uh, a critical value. So it will be always for uh, rich uh, uh, hydrogen, lean hydrocarbon. I uh, said that the theory is limited in the other regime, which is very interesting practically, but at the moment we don't have full understanding. Um, this is the neutral curve that showed a growing mode uh, when once the flame become unstable. So initially there is a small range of growing mode. You can see it here, uh, R equal to 11. The growth rate is uh, always negative, R equal to 16.25. Uh, it starts to become uh, uh, unstable, and the wavelength is about the six, and then uh, uh, goes the more and more unstable waves, which is what you see here. Now, uh, it's interesting that uh, this dashed curve here and dashed curve here, uh, essent well, the dashed curve here primarily, uh, 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 the limit uh, when the flame become very large tend to exactly the stability result of a planar flame. It's not very surprising, but it validates the theory because it tells you when the flame is sufficiently, the radius sufficiently large, you expect that the flame is almost flat. And so that's uh, a nice uh, verification. But uh, what is more interesting is that you see that the wave number n goes like, it's almost a straight line here, it's proportional to r. What it tells you that the wave uh, num uh, the wavelength, which is in this case 2 pi r over n, is almost a constant. So there is a minimum cell size or wrinkle that you will see on the flame. It's given by this expression. On the other hand, uh, in uh, the minimum because the lambda is reciprocal of n, of course. And here is the maximum. Uh, for the maximum, you see that n is nearly constant, so lambda will grow like r, which means that the, um, the, the large cells can grow bigger and bigger and bigger. But when the large cells go sufficiently big, and now it's more an interpretation of what you would expect to see, when the cells grow larger, they constitute a section of a spherical flame. And so that spherical flame starts to be unstable when that cell becomes big enough. So it will break into other cells. So you expect to see a breakup of cells. OK, uh, when you uh, increase the uh, uh, sigma, which is the 
for example, the heat release, then uh, the minimum, then the turning point or the nose of this peninsula uh, more move to, to the right. In other words, you would observe it at a later time. And when you change the Markstein number, it can also affect the onset of the instability. Uh, this is some experiment taken from a uh, group of Bradley uh, at Leeds. Uh, well, it's not an exact comparison, but it, it shows that there is some uh, range where you would expect to see these different cells, and uh, there is some kind of peninsula of the form that we have discussed. This is a more, a better comparison taken from uh, a paper with the group at Aachen, which I have mentioned earlier in one of the discussion, so that uh, we compared not only the, uh, the, 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 the growth of, or, or the, the behavior of a spherical flame, uh, but also the stability, and you see that the curve correspond quite reasonably well to what the theory has shown. Uh, here is uh, just uh, an example of a, uh, uh, numerically computed, uh, this is beyond linearity now, so it's numerically computed using the hydrodynamic theory or the hydrodynamic model, but now in the nonlinear regime, uh, but it's two dimension. In other words, it's a circle that uh, uh, grows. And you can see that initially the circle is a circle, and then at different times here you can see the creation of cells. If you look carefully here, you will see cells that have a cusp inward. Remember, this is a growing flame. The burn gas is inward. So the cusp is created pointing towards the burn gas, exactly the signature of Dari Lando instability. And uh, then uh, there is some uh, kind of, uh, in, in fact, here I repeated this. This is where you see cell formation. Um, and it's very similar to the Dari Lando instability. Uh, this uh, show, uh, this is what I just said before, that when the cells become uh, large enough, then uh, they behave like uh, a spherical flame. And so again, you have, uh, a, a, they split. And so that's where you get, I think the next one, so some splitting here and some coalescing here. In other words, they go big, they can coalesce. It's nonlinear effect, not from the linear theory. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, uh, if you look at the, at the growth rate, uh, sorry, at the propagation rate as a function of the mean radius, however mean is defined, uh, which, is, which is a question. What is the mean radius of this growing flame? So the way actually we defined it is we the equivalent sphere that contained the same amount of burned gas as the uh, uh, perturbed flame. Okay, that's the way you define I think it will come in maybe in the next lecture. Uh, so what you see here, it's the uh, flame which is uh, uh, stable. In other words, the perfectly sphere flame because remember it started growing and it, it has to asymptote the uh, a certain curve, a certain value, which I, 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 we computed to be sigma SL, right? Which is exactly this value. But the flames start to uh, be unstable, and so the propagation speed is larger because you have more surface area. And uh, there is uh, something which is decaying and then increasing, decaying, increasing. You see experimentally this was observed, and it was observed in a number of experiments. Uh, some people have called it a pulsation, but it's not really a pulsation. What it is, it's very simply, and we can see that because we can check exactly what happened here in the computation that we have. What you see is the, is the following. When cells coalesce, then uh, you have less surface area, propagates slower. And so that's what caused that drop. And then you have more cells uh, splitting, and you get the increase, OK? So this is that. This show you, oops. Well, how do I make this run? Oh, come on. 
So, um, I don't know. Anyway, this was would have been a nice uh, 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 movie of uh, a flame that propagate and uh, it remain uh, spherical during the entire uh, size of the window, which is quite large, 10 centimeter uh, in, in radius. And in this case, it developed an instability early on. It's hydrogen air and the onset of instability occur in the linear mixture. Uh, this is uh, also, I don't know why I cannot show them. Oh, here, this one you can see. So here is a spherical flame. It propagates out almost uh, uh, as a sphere all the time. Uh, those disturbances are due to the electrode and they're not intrinsic to the behavior of the flame. This is done at one atmosphere. Uh, at the higher uh, 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 pressure, the flame thickness is, you increase the pressure, you decrease the flame thickness. You decrease the flame thickness uh, the promote the instability, okay? So you promote the instability and indeed you see that it become unstable very early on. Okay, same mixture, same equivalence ratio. So, um, and these are in fact uh, the same taken from the same paper. So the flame here is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, at one atmosphere and then you increase the pressure. And of course, this is the one I just show you, but in between you have uh, the onset occurring uh, uh, at a different uh, time. Uh, so this is what I have referred to as uh, uh, the bifurcation diagram. So the cellular flames are the one that will be described by this uh, blue curve, and uh, those are, uh, you need a, a nonlinear theory to describe them. And uh, uh, the nonlinear theory was uh, develop in, 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 if you like, in uh, two steps, so in, uh, in a progression. First, there were studies that uh, allow for or, or were based on weak gas expansion, in other words, sigma minus one small, uh, but they were very illuminating because they are useful to study the next uh, uh, step, which is uh, uh, sigma not close to one using a hydrodynamic model numerically. And so the hydrodynamic model, you know, uh, I have put it just for, uh, uh, just for a reminder, but also to indicate that there are two key parameters. All the mixture properties are defined or determined by the Markstein uh, length, so the Markstein number and the density ratio, which is the gas expansion or the heat release. Now note that I have scaled here uh, my marks in lengths with respect to the domain uh, L of, uh, of, uh, of integration, but uh, in reality, mark, not in reality, but in conventionally, marks in number is defined as the ratio to the flame thickness. So the numbers may look different, but you can always interpret them in terms of the more convenient, uh, conventional uh, Markstein lengths. So what is the idea of the weekly number theory? The weekly nonlinear theory is effectively that uh, uh, you, you assume that the perturbation of the flat flame, which propagate down, uh, is uh, weak, so you write uh, sigma minus one phi, phi describe the perturbation. And uh, if the perturbation is weak, the flow field is weak. And if the flow field is weak, then you perturb it accordingly, and you obtain this equation for the equation that comes from the flame speed. Uh, a, a phi sub tau is like the propagation speed, v, Vf, what I called before. Uh, this uh, uh, nonlinear term, which is now, you see it's a nonlinear theory, so nonlinear effect become important because they help to saturate the growth. Otherwise, linear theory tells you the, the perturbation grow, 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 grow to infinity, but of course, once the perturbation is too big, 
you need something that will cause saturation and that those are the nonlinear terms. So this comes from the, uh, if you remember the normal, there is a square root of one plus phi sub, uh, well, sub y or sub x, depending on the coordinates you use, uh, square, and uh, for weak perturbation, uh, th this uh, can be pulled to the numerator, and so that's what this origin is. Uh, remember that the speed is the velocity of the flame relative to the gas, so this is the velocity of the gas. And uh, this comes from stretch, so you can argue why, why is only curvature. The answer is because uh, it's a weakly uh, uh, perturbed, uh, well, it's a weak thermal expansion. The velocities are small, stretch effects are small, and so they don't show up in this uh, uh, weakly nonlinear uh, theory. Uh, okay, so uh, this is good, but uh, uh, we still need the velocity of the gas. Well, uh, you have to solve your Navier-Stokes equation, but since uh, sigma minus one is small, the uh, Navier-Stokes equation get linearized, in other words, nonlinear term become uh, neglected, and the linearized equation can be solved by Fourier transform. And uh, out of this, you get a velocity which is obtained by this uh, double integral. Uh, it's an operator here, which uh, look uh, maybe uh, looks nasty, but uh, the operator is essentially, if it in in the Fourier space, if you operate this operator on say on a cosine, it's equivalent of multiplication by the. Uh, absolute value of the wave number on the function. So it has some nice properties. So when you substitute this into V, you get a single equation that depend on phi. Phi, 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 and this is known as the michelson sivashinsky equation, okay? It's an integral differential equation, PDE, and uh, you wanna solve it, you obtain the flame shape, okay? Now, uh, it's a nonlinear equation, integral differential equation. It turned out that this, oh, uh, just a minute. I'll say that in a minute. The first thing you do, you study the linear, anal uh, the linear analysis of this equation because you want to see that it's consistent with everything else that you knew before. So you do a, a, a perturbation e to the omega t, now t is tau, uh, i, 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 k, x, and uh, you neglect the nonlinear term. You obtain the dispersion relation it fits exactly the discussion that we had before. It tells you that if um, uh, the, the flame will be stable, uh, if the waves, uh, uh, if, if k is bigger than some critical value, which is one over two alpha. In other words, if you eliminate the long waves and your domain is uh, 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 shorter, then the flame will be stable and this is the size of the domain. If L is less than this number, which depend on the Markstein lengths, then the flame will be stable, otherwise it's unstable. Uh, the thing I just told you is that the beauty of that equation is that despite being nonlinear, and it has exact solution. And the exact solution we'll discover by two Allen and his uh, group, uh, but uh, in a, it came from a different context, uh, not flames, but then they was also in, applied to, to the michelson sivashinsky equation. In short, the michelson sivashinsky equation have solution which have this form. Uh, in other words, they propagate at a constant speed, capital U, uh, with a shape, uh, capital Phi of X, and this N tells you that there are, in fact, many, many solutions that depend on N. Uh, this Phi N is a summation of some cosine and so on, and that summation uh, depend on this capital N. So here are just samples of this phi N. Uh, the, if if uh, this is totally zero, then you get the flat flame, and then when you put N equal to one here, one term, you get the black curve. You put two terms, you get the red curves, then the green curves, and so on and so forth. So they are more cusp-like solution that the cusp, the amplitude grow faster, uh, larger and larger depending on n. So here they are. Uh, this is the n equal to one. 
This is the n equal to 2, so the n equal to 3, n equal to 4, and so on. Well, there are many solutions, so you still need to discuss their stability because otherwise you don't know which one is the one that you would observe. And uh, the study uh, uh, mentioned here uh, uh, have shown that for any value alpha, alpha is the reciprocal of the, alpha is essentially the way uh, the Markstein length, it was in the previous slide, uh, out of time I didn't emphasize it, uh, it was the Markstein uh, length, so one over alpha is the reciprocal of the Markstein length, okay? Scaled, scaled appropriately. So the studies show that there is always a stable solution, and the stable solution is the one with the larger n. Those are known as pole solutions. So it's the one with the largest number of poles is the steady solution, so uh, the stable solution. So this is the stable solution here, but now this is the one here, and this is the one here. So those are the stable solution, and the propagation speed of this solution is given here, of the stable solution. So you see that uh, the flat flame is stable for this parameter between zero and two. When you increase above two, you start developing a, a cusp-like solution that propagate, uh, as you increase uh, uh, this parameter, they propagate faster and faster. And then uh, they eventually there is a maximum speed which is about 12 and a half percent larger than the laminar flame speed. Uh, this uh, is an exam a numerical example of the michelson sevashinsky equation. You start with a highly corrugated random perturbation. And then you progress in time. And what you see is that uh, uh, suddenly the small cells start to coalesce, coalesce, and then uh, there is less and less cells and less cells. Here you see there are about two cells and eventually one cell develop. And what you see is that one cell propagate almost at a constant speed. The, the, the curves are for consecutive interval time, uh, uh, equivalent interval time, they are almost parallel. And so, and more than that, they tend exactly to the pole solution, the exact pole solution, which is again validation of the uh, numerical uh, scheme. Uh, it, 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 it falls exactly on this pole solution, it's exactly the same. So this is a, a nice validation of the results and of the theory. Now, uh, if you uh, take the fully nonlinear hydrodynamic model, the dispersion relation is a bit more complicated, uh, and uh, uh, again, you have a critical uh, wave number, and so again, you can determine the critical size of the domain above, below, above, below is stable, above is unstable, okay? And so now here is numerical, well, I'll skip this because of lack of time. Well, what I wanted to show here is that the initial, numerically, the initial gross, uh, which is shown here, uh, satisfy exactly the, 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 the Dario Landa gross that you expect. So initially it's, it's correct, and more than that, even though uh, the, the code that we, that we have developed to discuss uh, sigma order one, like five, six, seven, uh, you want to validate it, the best way to validate it is to take a small sigma and to see that the result collapse to the michelson sevashinsky equation, and here it is. Uh, it collapsed for 1.1 exactly to the pole solution that you have. So that's just a minus. So here are the results. The domain is uh, small. You start with a cosine. As time progresses, it develops into a flat flame. You increase the domain. Uh, it develops into a cusp flame that points out towards the burn gas. It propagates at a higher speed and you increase the domain further, uh, the, the, the amplitude, the, the peak uh, is sharper, and uh, the propagation speed is larger. And so you have again, no, no, it died. You have again a, 
I don't know why. You have again a, a bifurcation diagram as you see here. I don't know why it died on me. Uh, sorry, it's good that it's at least towards the end. Uh, so you have a bifurcation diagram. Uh, point, uh, I want to just point out that this direction is increasing m. I should have plotted this as 1 over m, so it looks better. But it's the same as 1 over m, but the numbers are different. Anyway, for uh, larger m or smaller reciprocal of m, the flame is uh, stable. Uh, and uh, you get the solution of the flat flame. It propagates at the speed 1. 1 is the axis. And then uh, when it becomes unstable, uh, m is in the supercritical regime. Uh, the flame propagates faster and faster. Those are the cusp-like flame. And this is uh, a comparison to a DNS. Uh, again, done in, uh, at ETH uh, with uh, some collaborator, Frozakis and his group, uh, of hydrogen air flame. You get, again, the same bifurcation diagram. This is a comparison of a DNS with detailed chemistry uh, done on hydrogen air flame, uh, phi equal to 1, sigma equal to whatever it is, and you see the comparison. Uh, here is an example of the, those numerical results that I mentioned. Again, it's a detailed chemistry. And what uh, represent here the flame surface is, as you see, it's the concentration of OH in the flame. And so you started with some uh, whatever initial perturbation and a one cusp solution develop. It persists even. Uh, in uh, the, when the domain is larger, H is 20 delta T. Again, you have one uh, cusp that develop. But remember, numerically, you have some numerical noise. So sometimes the one get kicked out and something happen. But eventually, it redevelops itself. And here is uh, uh, another one. But now phi is smaller. Now remember, phi is smaller, the Lewis number uh, gets, uh, we do it after, uh, gets um, um, the, the uh, well, I mean, the, the mixture uh, <laughs> got confused. The uh, phi is uh, smaller, so now the mixture uh, is uh, leaner, and so uh, it's no longer, yeah. It's no longer in that uh, regime that I talked before. So now thermal diffusive instability can affect the flame. And in fact, I think in the next one, uh, phi is half, and you see some effect of the thermal diffusive instability. I think the next one is even more. You see, there is a sort of a cusp, but then there are small perturbations that develop on top. And uh, you see here they are. Again, that's not in the theory. This one is more interesting because you will see initially very small cells, which are due to the thermal diffusive instability. See, here they are. Eventually, there is something like a cusp that behave, but there are always those small perturbations on the surface that develop due to uh, the thermal diffusive instability. In other words, due to the Lewis number effect, which is uh, not in the range of the theory that I have described. Now, I think I have gone over my time. This is the last figure I will show you. That's the uh, Dario Landau result, but for a three-dimensional flame, t equal to zero. We started with a highly corrugated flame. As time progressed, you see it develop into a uh, one-cusp uh, flame with, of course, some uh, ridges on the side because it's a square uh, domain, and this is the last uh, picture. The green points correspond to the different flames here, uh, which become more and more unstable, more peaked, more sharp. Note that the propagation speed of 3D is uh, significantly larger than 2D, which is clear because there is more surface area. And in fact, it's almost uh, 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 doubled in uh, speed or something like that. 
So uh, this is the end of today talk, of this talk. Thank you. Oh, I managed to do only five minutes. <laughs>
So anyway, this is just some preliminary comments that I want you to understand in what context this 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 uh, 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 the, the, this uh, lecture is. Uh, and so, uh, just a quick uh, reminder that a laminar flame speed uh, was for a, was the, defined as the speed of uh, the, in which this uh, very simple structure propagate into a quiescent mixture, and it has a very well uh, defined. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a very well defined uh, property. Uh, mathematically, it's a wave-like solution of the governing equation. It will propagate as a wave in one direction, and that's the speed. The question is, can you define uh, a turbulent flame speed uh, in some similar way? Um, so generally speaking, you say that the turbulent flame speed will define as the average rate of propagation uh, of a flame through a turbulent premixed gas mixture, which is instead of being quiescent as in the laminar flame, uh, uh, it's going to be of a zero mean, say. Okay? Or if you uh, sum, superimpose the flow, you want the flame to be, uh, I'm advancing myself because I will come to that in a minute, uh, you will be statistically stationary. So um, uh, can it be defined? Uh, perhaps it's a question, but there are some observations that indicate that it seems to be that there is such a thing as a turbulent flame speed. One of them is that uh, the turbulent flame propagate at a well-defined, uh, 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 they propagate a well-defined distance in a given time, and so that indication there may be some speed associated with this. And in a steady turbulent flow, such as abundant flame, you will see that on the average there is something like a, a conical flame which is fluctuate, of course, so the, probably there is such a thing. Of course, and that's very important to remember, that this can only apply to a regime which is known in the literature as flamelet or reaction sheet regime. Uh, it's not very obvious when the reaction is distributed in a large region because there is practically nothing that you can identify very clearly as a flame, and so that's not going to be relevant there. Okay, and this is just to show you experiment by uh, Kobayashi and his group uh, that show that uh, the, uh, the Bunsen flame has basically uh, a, a more or less a well-defined uh, triangular shape uh, fluctuating. Okay, uh, there have been uh, various experiments that were done, and the probably more recent one, I did not do any review of this. I just pulled out some reviews that were in the literature that show that the, the, uh, usually what you will see, the turbulent speed uh, reference relative to the laminar speed is plotted uh, against the turbulent intensity, V prime, which is essentially the RMS of velocity fluctuation. And um, the, what you see is that the, the data is rather scattered. And, uh, you know, people, the, the group by Bradley try at the time to, it's quite early, but still try to smooth out some of these uh, data to see if there is a trend. And perhaps the, uh, this is a better picture that I just wanted to show in general the trend. It's due to Kobayashi that you see that. Uh, of course, when V prime uh, goes to uh, uh, zero, it tends to a, a constant. I think uh, uh, he pulled out the constant to be one. I will argue that that's not always the case uh, later on. But anyway, it's close to one. And then uh, the curve seems to uh, be such that the propagation speed increase, but then the rate of increase is uh, much less as you increase the intensity, and so uh, this is often referred in the literature as the bending effect. Okay, so the turbulent flame speed, uh, again, I already said that in words a few minutes ago, so you have a, a fluctuating, that's a segment of the flame in a cross area A, 
uh, the flame is uh, fluctuating and so it has this shape and it propagates against a uh, 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 turbulent uh, region where it has a zero mean. So it's equivalent to a laminar flame propagating in a quiescent mixture. And so in that case, the propagation speed is going to be uh, ST, right? Now, uh, if uh, I uh, want to, uh, if I provide or if the turbulent flow coming, uh, the, the inflow, uh, is approximate is at the mean st then the flame will be held statistically stationary at one location okay so if i can maintain the flame statistically stationary at some location the mean velocity uh, of the inflow is essentially the turbulent flame speed okay so this configuration will be uh, uh, often uh, used in the discussion below uh, much of uh, turbulent the turbulent flame speed was uh, essentially, even nowadays, still related to uh, the ideas that were put forth by Dam Kohler. Uh, Dam Kohler suggested that there are two distinct uh, limiting regime, a small scale turbulence, uh, where the small eddies interact with the transport mechanism within the flame, and a large scale where the flame is thin, compared to the small turbulent scale and essentially turbulent flame interaction is kinematic. And these two regime have different names uh, nowadays. And uh, in the small scale turbulence, uh, in the small scale turbulence, uh, Dam Kohler suggested, similar to the laminar flame speed, which is proportional to the square root of the thermal diffusivity divided by the time, uh, the the, the, the residence time, TF, uh, the, the turbulent speed will be some turbulent diffusivity divided by the, uh, um, uh, by the uh, time, TF. And so uh, if you take the ratio, it's going to be a square root of the, of the turbulent diffusivity to the thermal diffusivity. And then you say, well, the turbulent diffusivity will be uh, made up of the, or be proportional to the fluctuation V prime times the, some integral scale that represent the average, say, eddies, uh, if you like, roughly speaking, uh, in the field. And so the, uh, the, the ratio will be proportional to essentially V prime and the ratio of the integral scale to the flame thickness. So that was his suggestion, but I want to focus on the ladder because on the ladder, ladder meaning the large scale turbulence where the argument was very simply the inflow uh, is uh, the mass flux is uh, the density times the cross sectional area A. And if the flame is statistically stationary, it's, uh, then uh, it's held at a, const uh, at a constant location. The inflow, the mass flux is rho UA uh, multiplied by st, and uh, that same mass flux is totally consumed at this highly corrugated flame, and so the uh, and if each segment propagate at the laminar flame speed sl, then uh, m uh, will be rho u times the mean of the area, uh, or often referred to as the area of the turbulent flame times the laminar flame speed, which is going to be the, the averaging this quantity. And so when you equate the two, you get that the ratio of the turbulent flame speed to the laminar flame speed is the area ratio, the, the, the ratio of the, of the area of this fluctuating uh, 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 surface to the cross-sectional area. This is uh, only works when uh, of course, the flame is statistically stationary uh, under statistically stationary condition. I point that out because I will want to do something later about an expanding flame, and so the question, what is the cross-sectional area in that case? Uh, and uh, then Dam Kohler argued that the area ratio should be proportional to V prime over, you know, it's associated with the fluctuation of the turbulent intensity or the turbulent intensity and so 
He suggested that SD is proportional to V prime. And then there was a study by Shelkin that argue based on this geometric figure, which I am not going to describe because then I will not uh, finish on time, that the, uh, that the ratio is the square root of 1 plus V prime over SL square. And uh, so uh, if, the, if the intensity is small, uh, it's going to behave uh, like a V prime square. And if the intensity is large, it behaves like what Dem Kohler suggested. At any rate, there were some such uh, development early on. Uh, most of the discussion in the literature uh, assumes some kind of dependence on the uh, intensity with a power n, whether it's derived, obtained, uh, whatever you like, with a coefficient c that uh, both uh, are uh, essentially uh, adjustable constant that uh, are obtained, uh, say, empirically, okay? Again, I, I want to re-emphasize what I said in the first two statements starting this lecture. I am not giving you a description here neither of the uh, wealth of uh, 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 numerical simulation and DNS in this topic. I want to focus only on uh, a very narrow uh, uh, part of the uh, discussion, which is based on uh, the hydrodynamic theory that I developed uh, to you earlier this week. So now, uh, first of all, I want to revisit the idea of Dam Kohler. Uh, Dam Kohler assumed that every segment here propagate at the laminar flame speed, and uh, if the segment propagate at the local flame speed, which depend on the Markstein length and stretch, then when uh, in this uh, uh, mass flux, which consume, so mass, I mean, uh, what uh, the flame consumed uh, all the reactant, then the mass flux is given by uh, the density times the mean of ATSF, okay? Uh, SF, including the uh, stretch. And so, uh, and so the, ratio of the turbulent speed to the laminal speed is not only the area ratio, but also it includes the effect of stretch, and so uh, it could, there, are, there may be other effect than surface area that would affect the speed. Uh, of course, if one assumes that uh, SF is SL, then you obtain them colors so as uh, But otherwise, uh, uh, I want to compute the turbulent speed either from this relation or equivalently if uh, I can maintain in my uh, uh, model the flame statistically stationary, then it's effectively the incoming flow. And moreover, I will even compare those two results, and I don't know if I'm going to show you that, but they give you the, basically the same answer. Okay. So just again to remind you, this is the hydrodynamic model that I will use, Navier-Stokes equation, an interface, density ratio, rho u, rho b, and the propagation speed uh, depend on flame stretch. That SF depends on stretch. Just to emphasize something which is sometimes uh, get confused by uh, some uh, people, uh, uh, this is not the so-called G equation. This is a fully coupled nonlinear model between the flame and the flow field. Uh, the flow field uh, is affected by the flame because of uh, stretch, and the flame affects the flow field because the density, uh, because, well, I mean, both are affected. The, the, the flow is affected by the density ratio, which as the flame propagates, the density ratio in the field changes, okay? So this is a, you have to solve this entire problem. Uh, you can use a, you can non-dimensionalize it using length L, which is a domain length for simplicity, the laminar flame speed SL and the time, which means that the Markstein number that I will uh, uh, use is not, again, the conventional Markstein number, which is relative to the flame thickness, but rather relative to the domain. But the interpretation of one to the other is easy to make. 
uh, and I will only focus on uh, a Lewis number bigger than one because the as I told you before, the theory is not complete for Lewis number less than one. Uh, not Lewis number effective. In fact, I say bigger than one, but what I meant bigger than the critical value which I showed you, which is close to one. So the only parameter in this model is the Markstein number and the density ratio or the thermal expansion, plus the flow parameter, which is the intensity and integral scale uh, of the of the turbulence. Now, uh, this is, uh, it seems like simple when you look at it, but this is a, actually mathematically is a challenging problem because it's not, it's a free boundary problem in when you solve the equation, you have also to determine the interface and the interface is part of the solution that change as the flame evolves. So it's rather quite involved. I put here, uh, well, I sort of discussed the, the advantage of this, but if you like, let's run it through quickly again. It's uh, perhaps more computationally affordable than the full problem, uh, but it's still challenging. Uh, is based on physical first principle, despite the fact that it has the limitation that turbulence does not affect the flame structure or the internal flame structure. Other than that, uh, there is no uh, turbulence modeling. There is no uh, uh, any other advantage, uh, any other adjusting parameter. There are fewer parameter. I just indicated what they are. Uh, the flame in this model is unambiguously determined as the surface that you uh, follow. And so uh, you can uh, examine as the flame propagate, whether it falls, whether it breaks. In other words, you, you, you have a surface that you can clearly identify its uh, morpholo morphological uh, changes. And the uh, determination of things like curvature, strain, degree of wrinkling can be uh, uh, therefore done quite easily. Uh, Okay, so in order to describe the model, I have, of course, to start with the realization of some uh, turbulence, and this is done uh, like what uh, is done in the, in the literature, uh, nothing new here. So you start with creation of a, uh, a pre-generated turbulent field, and uh, you feed it at uh, the bottom at some velocity v uh, in, uh, the inflow. And uh, to maintain uh, the flame at some uh, uh, statistically stationary uh, location, uh, you use a control uh, system. You just change v, uh, v inflow until this is held at the position that, uh, that uh, you want. Uh, note, by the way, that this flame has a piece here and a piece here, right? This, uh, and so, uh, the flame can be tracked even if it's not one continuous surface. The only thing that it does not do, if you have extinction, that cannot be described by this model unless you add something in an ad hoc way. Okay, so here is, a, uh, here is the way that uh, this uh, uh, control system operates. You use a PID-like uh, uh, closed loop control system you determine this constant, and you see, for example, in this case, the flame position uh, after a very short time uh, is uh, held at the position that you want, and you can do the same thing with a different control system for the velocity. So you see that the inflow velocity eventually reach some uh, uh, value, and that will be the, actually the turbulent speed uh, as long as the flame is maintained statistically stationary. And uh, this is uh, the equivalent thing that was done in 3D instead of 2D. Again, look at the flame, how uh, it's quite convoluted, and there are even pieces or section up here and up there. Uh, what you see here is, of course, the vorticity, same thing as you see here. Here, the vorticity is uh, red and blue. It's counter uh, di different direction. And uh, here you just see uh, some, uh, 
some range of vorticity. It's uh, the way that uh, this is typically used uh, in various uh, similar studies. So, um, and uh, just as an example, uh, here is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the result of this simulation. You see the flame uh, is more or less at a, a constant location. On the top figure, you can see the projection of the flame on the, uh, on, on the so-called walls, or the walls of the domain, and you see that uh, it sometimes folds and so on. Okay, uh, and so uh, I wanna start the discussion just to try to understand various uh, flame properties based on this model. So the first thing is uh, to see how the flame behave uh, uh, when the Markstein number is uh, small or a little larger. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, and a little smaller. Small and a little small. Now remember from the previous discussion, uh, the more stable flame, so to speak, is when the Markstein number is larger. The Markstein number smaller makes the flame more unstable. And so what you see in this picture is that the terminals just affect the flame very slightly. But in this case, what you see, there is a sharper change with quite a bit of vorticity uh, produced at the tip. So you have this uh, signature of the Dari Landau instability. And so uh, uh, here are the two cases uh, for what I would distinguish as a subcritical and supercritical. This is results of a laminar flame stability. So I am not claiming that this picture correspond to turbulence. It's, but it more or less indicative the range of sub and supercritical. Of course, once the flame becomes become turbulence, then whatever I call sub and supercritical may be slightly different. But clearly what you see, it's a region where uh, the flame on the average is almost Planar. Here it become less, but there is some uh, uh, still similar behavior. Unlike those for the same intensity that behave exactly like the Dario Landau flame in laminar condition, and here the fluctuation are more significant. Okay, and if you carry the, uh, and if you look at, for example, PDF of a flame position, uh, you will see that. Um, well, the red and blue are indicated here. Uh, so the uh, red in subcritical, so you see the, the PDF of the position is almost symmetric. In other words, there's the same distances that the flame uh, uh, appear below the mean and above the mean, it's about equal. Uh, whereas uh, in uh, the supercritical, which is this, there is a, an asymmetry of the flame due to uh, what you see here. There is a more region that peaks in the burn gas. And that you can also see the curvature where there is a more negative, uh, uh, more frequent negative values which is due to the, uh, uh, the cusp behavior uh, of the, uh, the Dario Lando type effect. And if you go to a larger uh, and larger intensity that uh, were computed, you see that at large density, then they both try to look almost the same. In other words, now the turbulence uh, is affecting the flame and it's controlling the behavior. And so, well, if we were to able to carry this to much higher intensity, perhaps, uh, the flame brush that uh, is described by this delta, which is shown in this graph, perhaps they will start to tend to the same value. It's not done yet here, but uh, anyway. Uh, this is what this uh, described. Then, um, then uh, here I just wanted to again show you the difference between a subcritical and supercritical. In three dimension, you see subcritical. It's a weakly curved uh, uh, planar, whereas in a supercritical condition, uh, you have this uh, highly corrugated uh, surface. Um, 
you can uh, look at experimental results and also interpret these results of Kobayashi as being subcritical and supercritical, where supercritical show this cusp, unlike the more smooth curved surfaces on the left. Uh, why do I call this subcritical and this supercritical? Simply because uh, uh, the Markstein length is proportional to the flame thickness. And when you uh, increase the pressure, you decrease LF. So you increase the pressure, you make the Markstein number uh, uh, smaller, and that makes uh, uh, the flame more unstable, which is the supercritical case. And so uh, this is uh, why I refer this to supercritical compared to the subcritical, and these are similar results, but now it's the equivalence ratio that is changed, and these were taken from uh, 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 a uh, result by Creta and Trojani, or Trojani and Creta. These are experiments, these are some simulations. And again, you see the difference between smooth and the cusp-like uh, structure that developed. And you can also see that in the context of a Bunsen flame, but to tell you what, I'm going to skip on those and move on. <laughs> uh, where should I do that? I'll skip this time. Essentially, you see in a Bunsen flame, uh, the, well, what was done here is what, uh, in a Bunsen flame, you have the perturbation that created here are convected uh, with the tangential velocity of, uh, of, the, of the flow. And so they either tend to become larger and larger uh, in the case where the flame is unstable, like the supercritical, and, uh, and they tend to be uh, very small, uh, very minor, if, uh, I mean, not very affected in the subcritical case. Uh, the reason that you see nothing on the right, because this is uh, done numerically, and so what was done is to perturb only the half to the left and not the half to the right, so that to see the effect, because otherwise uh, what's going on the tip will affect everything. And, so. and what you see, the difference between the subcritical and supercritical, again, it's in the local curvature, which in this case seem to be quite small compared to the large uh, uh, curvature that you see uh, in this case, because again, the cusp-like behavior due to the Dario Landau effect. Now, uh, turbulent flame speed versus area ratio. So here are the two values of the Markstein number, subcritical, the black, supercritical, uh, the blue. Uh, there are a few things to indicate here. The first thing uh, is that the area ratio, uh, and uh, this V prime is, uh, forget the C, it's in, they can different graphs, but anyway, it's, uh, it's intensity. So again, we are plotting the flame turbulent flame speed, I don't know why it's not written here, as a function of the intensity. And, uh, oh, actually it's not because it's, it's two different things. So uh, this is the area ratio, uh, which seemed to be uh, for the two values, subcritical, supercritical, above or larger than the turbulent uh, flame speed to the laminar flame speed. In other words, the exponent here, n, is larger than the exponent n. That's one thing to notice. Note that there is also a difference between the subcritical and the supercritical. Note also that the subcritical flame tend to one in the limit when, inten when the turbulence go to zero. But the supercritical do not. The reason is because when V prime goes to zero, the flame will tend to go to a pl flat flame, but the flat flame is not stable under this condition. So the only stable flame that you have is the Dari Landau type flame with a sharp uh, 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 cusp, and those, as we have seen earlier today, propagate at a speed which is uh, 15, 20 percent larger than the laminar flame speed. So it's not surprising that the speed here goes to a larger value than one. And this is one of the effects of the Dario Landau uh, uh, effect, which I call the Dario Landau speed enhancement. Um, the other thing which I commented earlier 
uh, is that uh, the area ratio is not similar to the uh, ratio of the turbulent speed to the laminar speed, and uh, approximately the difference is the effect of stretch, which uh, for positive L uh, is, um, uh, is causing a decrease. It's a factor that decreases the uh, area ratio by a certain amount, which is the mean stretch rate uh, K, which I will talk about uh, in a minute. I said uh, approximately because, of course, uh, this is the, the mean of the product is not the product of the mean, but uh, the, the, it's a, it's a numerically appears to be approximately the same. Uh, uh, both, though, seem to indicate something which is similar to what is referred to as a bending effect, and I'll make a comment about that later. Uh, actually, the comment will come now. So here I've taken uh, uh, the turbulent beam. This is in 2D, so the result that I'm presented is a mixture of 2D and 3D, depending on the, what I have available to discuss the point I'm trying to make. So this is the flame at uh, five consecutive times, uh, very close to each other. Uh, you see that the flame here starts folding. It folds like that. Uh, and here, uh, fold changes, it getting here more pinched. The flame get pinched as pocket of the flame pops out, and it get consumed very quickly, and then it disappears during that time interval. And um, uh, here is the same sequence, more or less, more or less, I mean, maybe with few more steps. And uh, what you see here, uh, is the turbulent speed as uh, the turbulent flame speed and the area ratio. So uh, here I called it AF, but it's the same as before. So at, uh, you see that uh, uh, what happened is that uh, as the flame fold, the area of course increases, and so increases and increases, and then it drops very drastically uh, when uh, the uh, when the fold. Uh, when I mean, get pinched and the creation of that pocket. So similarly, the turbulent flame speed go up and then it drops. So the idea is that, or the, the suggestion is that frequent flame folding leading to pocket creation and detachment cause significant reduction in the average main flame surface area, which may explain, and this happened very frequently, it may explain the, at higher and higher intensity, it may explain the leveling of the uh, rate of increase of the burning velocity or this uh, bending effect. So this is a plausible explanation based on this calculation. Now I have shown you uh, such curves for before for two uh, values, and here is the, um, uh, turbulent flame speed uh, for different Markstein number. The, the two uh, at the, uh, here, the black and the brown, those two are subcritical, so they tend more or less to one. And uh, the other tend to a higher value, which uh, uh, keep on increasing when you decrease the Markstein number because the flame is more and more unstable in that regime. And, uh, but uh, also the turbulent speed uh, get, uh, is different because it depends, of course, on mixture and other properties that uh, determine the Markstein uh, number. Uh, these are results of 3D calculation. Again, you have the Dario Landau enhancement here. And, uh, uh, and, ah, okay, and if, now, so if I scale the turbulent speed not with the laminar speed, but with the laminar propagation speed of the planar flame for that particular Markstein number, namely one if it's subcritical and UL, which is higher uh, uh, for uh, a, a, when the flame is uh, supercritical, then you see that all the data tend to one as it should, which is, uh, uh, which is what this graph indicates. Okay, uh, in the 3D calculation, we also see that uh, the turbulent speed is larger than the area ratio, 
It would be the same if it was on the diagonal, but it's always uh, below, so that's consistent with what I said before. And uh, note that uh, the, um, the, uh, this uh, stretching effect or this factor is essentially the local flame speed, and so the mean local flame speed uh, is uh, plotted here, and for a positive Markstein number, it uh, uh, decreases as the intensity uh, increases, okay? Uh, and in the next uh, graph, I will uh, show the uh, mean stretch rate, okay? Uh, note that, again, as uh, uh, you uh, increase uh, the inverse uh, Markstein number, you make the flame more and more unstable, supercritical as opposed to subcritical. Uh, but in any case, the, uh, the stretch rate increases as the fluctuation increases, so as the turbulent intensity increases. And it is, as you see here, associated with the strain and very minimal with curvature. So it's not the mean curvature which uh, increases with uh, turbulent intensity, but it's rather the uh, mean uh, uh, strain, uh, the straining that uh, increases. Okay, and uh, this is uh, some scaling law that uh, uh, seem to be uh, to fall from all the calculation done for different sigma, different uh, Markstein number, and so on. And note that what is graphed here uh, is not the turbulent speed, but the turbulent speed uh, divided by this stretch factor, so it's more or less equivalent to the area ratio, if you like. And uh, there is a different correlation between the subcritical and supercritical, and you can represent them as intensity and uh, Markstein number as such. So the turbulent speed will be that stretching factor multiplied by these for sub and supercritical flames. And uh, there are experiments. Uh, these are experiments done here at Princeton uh, at uh, the direction of Professor Lowe, who just came in to see his graph uh, <laughs> presented. <laughs> so. Uh, and uh, those are spherical flames, but nevertheless, uh, the, if, you, if you interpret the, the intensity, the Markstein lengths according, you see that there is a very, very similar trend. And so one can perhaps write such uh, a correlation uh, for, um, you know, for uh, this uh, condition. I, 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 don't, I remember that I tried to see if that will fit more the supercritical or the subcritical. I, I don't remember now the details. Uh, it, it certainly is closer to one of those and not the other. Perhaps the supercritical, because they probably measured it when the flame become highly uh, unstable. Uh, and uh, the, here is another uh, relation to those of Kobayashi, we, where here the uh, the plot is against uh, the pressure, but remember, right, it's a turbulent speed against the uh, uh, pressure multiplied by, well, I mean, the correlation is pressure times the intensity, but uh, uh, I have mentioned earlier that the Markstein length uh, change uh, is proportional to the flame thickness, and so you increase the pressure, you decrease the flame thickness, so there is uh, you can rewrite this, uh, this correlation in terms of pressure in t instead of uh, L, and so you will see a similar kind of trend. Uh, it's a very, it's not an exact comparison, don't misunderstand me, uh, there is a similar trend and that's all I'm saying. Uh, spherical flame, there is a lot of interest in spherical flame in, the, in, 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 in many labs all around. I pointed out a few, and this is what we have done in a spherical flame. So first of all, we create a very large uh, uh, domain uh, turbulence, some turbulent field. Uh, and then we are going to focus only on a certain uh, uh, part of that domain, okay? So there is a pre-generated homogeneous isotropic turbulent flow with zero mean created. 
um, by standard methods that are available in the literature, I'm not going to specify now. Uh, a flame kernel uh, is initially uh, 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 created at the center of the domain, and uh, we are using, again, the hydrodynamic model to see how the flame would propagate out. The computation were limited to this white square, which is about 80% of the domain, so nothing in the boundary would affect the flame. And the flame will look, as you will see, very spherical all the way to that uh, uh, extent. Uh, people ask immediately, well, your turbulence, of course, uh, will decay. Of course, turbulence decay. So when we have seen that turbulence decay more than 20%, calculation were stopped. Okay, so here is uh, just, uh, those are pictures of uh, a spherical flame. I think I wanted to show you the first two before, but my pointer didn't work. So here it is, it's a highly spherical flame in a quiescent mixture is always spherical. Uh, this one become unstable eventually. Uh, and so you see the cells, so the wrinkling being created. And this one is turbulence, so turbulence is uh, uh, very quickly uh, affecting uh, the flame. Okay, so uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an example of uh, the calculation that I will show you. Uh, the time is not real time. It was done to make the video short. But essentially what you see uh, is that uh, the turbulence, the weaker turbulence in the burn gas, which is on the average uh, has to be almost constant, uh, zero. And, uh, and you see uh, highly wrinkled surfaces, pocket formation, and so on. Uh, and so uh, uh, at uh, the sequence of things, as we increase the intensity, start with the uh, formation of uh, um, well, you have a highly spherical flame here that are suddenly, they uh, develop their lander instability, cell formation. You see they are pointing towards the burn gas as we expect, and then you see here cells uh, splitting, okay? But uh, the flame remains smooth initially and spontaneously take a cellular appearance. Uh, what you see here, it reminds us the stability results uh, in laminar condition. When you, uh, that's what I said here. So the flame is a bit resilient to the turbulent under this condition. And then uh, when you increase uh, low to moderate turbulent intensity, you start seeing uh, 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 cell splitting, coalescing, and eventually an irregular structure as opposed to the under laminar condition. It seems like the initial disturbances keep a certain uh, uh, constant behavior uh, uh, on the splitting and the cell formation. And uh, this is at uh, larger turbulent intensity. Well, again, I discussed that before, so I won't repeat it. Uh, what uh, you see now, the same sequence, but we want to see the effect on the flame brush. So at uh, low intensity, the flame brush is nearly, uh, it's nearly flat or not highly uh, it's not very thick, and then it gets uh, thicker and, uh, and thicker when the turbulence become the dominant uh, uh, factor. By the way, those are flames which are superimposed, of course, at different times. I hope you have caught that. So uh, uh, there was a question that I posed earlier. Uh, the, in the dam color hypothesis, you, uh, you refer uh, the turbulent uh, area to the cross-sectional area, but what is the cross-sectional area in, in, in an expanding flame? And so uh, the way that uh, we have found it to be the best way, it's the equivalent radius or the equivalent uh, circle that encompass the same amount of burn uh, gas as is, as is in, encompassed in the, inside the fluctuating surface. And so uh, that's basically what, uh, what it is for different intensities. It's just a representation. 
I'm going to be a little quicker. Actually, I'm almost on time. Uh, and then what we see, it's a very interesting result. Uh, I think that the area ratio, when you refer it to the uh, mean radius, uh, sort of equilibrate or saturate to some value. In other words, there is a certain amount of wrinkling that occur, but when the flame grows sufficiently large and the calculation were done for really sufficiently long time, uh, there is seem to be some saturation. And so uh, to explain this, we looked at the fractal dimension of the, uh, of the surface, which indicates some uh, uh, degree of wrinkling, and we see that that is also uh, uh, being saturated. Of course, it's, it's larger, the larger the intensity is. And if uh, here is a plot of the fractal dimension as a function of intensity uh, in the asymptotic regime, namely in the regime where you have reached uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, saturation. So clearly, uh, an increase uh, in fractal dimension with turbulent intensity, but it seems also to reach some kind of uh, uh, constant value. And um, uh, uh, for the spherical flame as well, or an expanding flame as well as for the planar flame I showed you before, there is a difference between the turbulent speed and the area ratio. And uh, for the Markstein number positive that I have been focusing on, uh, the turbulent, the area ratio will overestimate the turbulent speed. And uh, the, the, the difference is usually due to stretching, as I've shown before. So here the same uh, is true. And uh, we have uh, taken those results and put some scaling law in case that become useful. And you see that the, the uh, exponents are quite different for uh, area ratio and flame uh, ratio. And uh, this is a um, view of the uh, statistical results. This one is the PDF of uh, curvature. Uh, you see that uh, uh, the blue curve corresponding to the low intensity, uh, then you have a um, uh, what you have is a, uh, this is what, PDF versus intensity, then you have uh, an, uh, relative to the mean, you have an asymmetric, is that related to curvatures? Uh, I think it is. Let me see the next one. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, oh, the blue curve is here. Sorry, that's what I got confused. The blue curve is, the, is this one, and you see there's uh, the, the probability of negative uh, curvature is quite high, and this is due to the creation of the Darius Landau instability, the, the, the cusp. But at higher intensity, things, uh, uh, the turbulence is dominated, and so uh, the flame uh, is uh, uh, equally curved in uh, negative curvature as, as well as positive curvature, has equally. And uh, whereas the strain uh, is, uh, is become, uh, uh, again, highly strained, but uh, there is, uh, uh, it's more positive as the intensity grow larger. Uh, this is the, just to show, well, th those should have been shown in sequence, curvature and, uh, and straining, that's the total curvature. And that's the local flame speed, the local flame speed uh, for different intensity. Anyway, this can uh, uh, better, carefully looking at this, can explain some of the uh, properties that I have shown you earlier. I think this is my last slide. I wanted to finish this one on time, so I finished before the time <laughs> by cutting here and there. So thank you very much. and. Um, um, this uh, is the end of my lecture, so... <laughs>